All right, everybody, we're going to get started in like two minutes, two minutes of the period. is too heavy. We all settled in, everybody. I was giving side eye to Mary. I was like, let's go. Check one, two, check one, two. Is that all right for everybody? We good? Isaac, we're good? Will, wherever you went, are we good? Mary, stop talking. Take your seat. All right, guys, good morning. So happy to see everyone in the room, as well as everybody online streaming. I really appreciate it. Um, so welcome to our annual grad student symposium. Um, it's, yeah. I'm extremely excited to be here um, and to see everyone in person, as well as, you know, to be able to stream online for the people who can't make it. Uh, our theme this year is scholarship that matters. And so what you will hear are students, faculty, and alumni in discussion about how the work we do addresses pressing social problems, improves our understanding of the past and the present, and brings about progressive change. Uh, as I said, I'm really excited to share this with you and share these conversations and also for the conversations to continue. Uh, as I think I told many of you individually, I hope this is the beginning of something rather than the end of something. So building our community back up in the pandemic and hopefully returning to campus um, a stronger community. So I hope we uh, operate with that spirit in mind today. A couple quick things. So I want to share some good news I think I've already shared online via email. Um, as you know, uh, Professor Mary Rizzo, Associate Professor of History at American Studies, won our Scholar Teacher Award at, uh, for Rutgers. Uh, and no surprise to us, um, based on her work as both a teacher and a researcher in the public humanities. So congratulations, Mary. Uh, Doctors Naomi Extra and Lauren O'Brien won the best dissertation in uh, for the Graduate School of Newark this year. So congratulations to them, as well as their advisors, Ruth Feldstein and Mary Rizzo. Um, some of you know, Dr. Extra is currently an ACLS Emerging Voices Fellow in Feminist Knowledge and Social Justice at Rutgers New Brunswick. I feel like this, there we go. Uh, and Dr. O'Brien will be starting a new full-time position with the Getty, Getty Conservation Institute 
with their LA African American Historic Places Project, um, working with preservationists and city architects to identify and register historic sites related to black history and culture in LA. So congratulations to both of them. Um, so, <laughs> yes. So a few other things. I have a lot of people to thank, so I'm gonna do that very quickly now and again at the end of the program. Thanks to SASN Dean Jacqueline Mattis and her office, Graduate School Newark Dean, Tajania Henderson and her staff for the support of our program throughout the year and the symposium. I uh, also wanna thank our co-sponsors, the Humanities Action Lab, which gave us access to this room today. Uh, the Departments of English, History and African-American and African Studies, uh, Chair, uh, Chair Belinda Edmondson, Chair John Keane, uh, and Chair Beryl Satter, who I think is here, right? Yeah, there she is, thank you. Uh, and to their administrators, Christina Strasberger and Madeline Munoz Bertram. So thank you to them. Um, as most of you know, this is my first year as director and first symposium. So uh, I've been greatly aided by two other people I want to know, uh, Jason Cortez and Rob Snyder, the former directors of American Studies, who you all know. I really appreciate them fielding phone calls and emails at all hours to help me with problems um, and basically just answering new guy questions. So thank you to them. Uh, and lastly, I want to thank our program administrator, Sonia Espinay, for putting together all the food, all the logistics. We'll have to pause for applause there again. Okay. Um, people just knew to do it, uh, as well as Associate Director of American Studies, Alex Chang. Uh, their expertise and experience has been invaluable to me and to making American Studies run up to now and through this year. So thank you so much to them. Lastly, so before we begin, masks are not required, but encouraged. I see all of you wearing them, so I appreciate it. We are streaming and recording, so if you want to see any part of this again, it will be up on the SASN YouTube link, eyes are shaking, yes, uh, as well as available through a link on our website. One more thing on there, that's about it. Ah, yes, please avail yourself of the food, um, so coffee and snacks from Black Swan, as well as lunch from the Fruit Architects. Uh, thanks again to Sonia for organizing that. Um, and at the end of the program today, there'll be unofficial half hour at McGovern's for anybody who wants to continue the conversation. No pressure to attend, but hopefully if you're hanging around, you will come and uh, share a drink. All right, so I'm gonna introduce our first round table. Um, so you guys can come on up as soon as I'm done. The elusiveness of shared authority while the monograph reigns supreme moderated by Dr. Mary Rizzo and featuring PhD candidates in American studies, Hannah Jocelyn, City Johnson, and Aaron Santana. So come on up guys. Uh, thank you so much, Kyle, for uh, organizing this. And thank you, Sonia, for uh, being a organizational wizard as well. Um, it is really exciting to see all of you folks in person. And to all the people who are watching online, I'm just going to generally wave. Anyway, um, so <laughs> um, the topic of this roundtable, the elusiveness of shared authority while the monograph reigns supreme, is, um, I think, really important. I was really honored to be asked to moderate this roundtable because the issues that we're discussing here today, I think, are, are very important to me personally. And I think that the uh, three PhD candidates sitting next to me are doing really extraordinary work in thinking deeply about these issues. So I just want to say for two minutes, a couple of framing uh, statements right, or some thoughts. Um, so shared authority is obviously key to our discussion today. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar with the concept of shared authority or the theory of shared authority, um, it's a concept that was coined or a term that was coined by oral historian Michael Frisch in the 1990s. And Frisch came to this concept by asking what seems like a very simple question was actually quite a deep question. Who is the author of an oral history interview? Is it the interviewer or is it the person being interviewed, the narrator? And of course, the answer is it's both, right? Which led him to conceptualize this idea that authority in oral history is always shared. Um, no one person has control over uh, the oral history interview. But that said, since Frisch coined that term, it's taken on uh, a new life and gone and been um, utilized in a, a number of different fields and in a number of different ways. In public history, I would say that primarily it's used to think about interpretive authority over final products. So over books or exhibits or dissertations as in the case of um, our conversation today. So how do we think about breaking down the hierarchies between scholars and communities? 
What does it mean to do that? What does it mean to do that ethically? And is it possible to do that as a graduate student during a dissertation process? So I think at the heart of our conversation today, we're really talking about the production of knowledge. Um, everybody produces knowledge all the time, right? So like two people walking out of a movie, how old I am, two people walking out of a movie, who walks out of a movie? Anyway, but two people walk out of a movie having a conversation about like what that movie makes them think about are producing knowledge, right? But only certain kinds of knowledge are given credibility within the academy, generally speaking. And so the conversation for this round table really wants to question that and poke at what kinds of knowledge do we see as valuable? Who produces that knowledge? Who gets, who benefits from that knowledge? Uh, so I think those are some of the questions that we'll hear um, discussed today. So let me just tell you how this round table is gonna go. So we really want, and this is actually, I mean, these guys are the ones who are, um, conceptualizing this round table. So what, what we're looking for is conversation. So each of um, the panelists will speak for five minutes. I'll give you a heads up when you when four minutes have elapsed. I'll let you know when five minutes have elapsed because timekeeping is X. And, um, <laughs> and then um, we'll go through and everyone is going to state a couple of questions that they see as topics for conversation. So what we hope to do with the time that we have on this panel is actually have a conversation between all of us. I'm not sure how that works with the folks on Zoom, but um, have a conversation between all of us. So if you have specific questions for one of the panelists, that's okay, but I think what we'd really prefer is more like a discussion, right? Um, and, um, and really thinking through some of the problems that are being presented today, okay? Um, so, and then we'll wrap up with just some closing thoughts from all the panelists. So um, let me introduce all of our uh, panelists first, and um, then I'll let them get started. So um, our first speaker today is Erin Santana, who is at the end. Erin uh, is a doctoral candidate in American studies at Rutgers University, Newark, whose dissertation, Silencing the Classroom, Ocean Hill, Brownsville, and the Production of the History of Education, explores the relationship between collective memory and public education with a focus on New York City's movements for uh, community control. Erin um, spent the past 15 years working at museums, historic sites, and New York City public schools to engage learners of all ages in radical history telling and history making. Erin also works with me on the project that I'm doing right now with Chicory Magazine um, and has been an amazing, amazing collaborator on that. Um, our next speaker is going to be Hannah Jocelyn. Uh, Hannah is a PhD candidate in the American Studies program who is working on literary environmentalism as it manifests in contemporary writing by women who have lived for at least five years in both Canada and the US or in a territory that crosses the settler colonial boundary, a state of being and creating she's calling intercitizenship. Um, and then our, our final uh, panelist for today will be Sydney Johnson, who is a public historian and PhD candidate in American studies. Her work focuses on heritage and the public memory of black women's labor and economic agency in the early 20th century. And in her spare time, wherever that may be, um, she enjoys thrifting and supporting black owned businesses. All right, so I'm going to um, hand uh, the mic over to Erin. Shared authority. Um, no, that's not actually what it is. Um, all right. So good to see everyone. Um, as Mary just said, uh, my dissertation research documents and explores the role of history telling and ongoing movements for educational justice and self-determination in New York City. Uh, and this scholarly project and calling found me during my time teaching at a transfer high school in Brownsville, Brooklyn, which was the epicenter over this conflict over African-American and Puerto Rican control of local schools in the late 1960s. And as an emerging scholar, I have remained in continuous relationship with teacher, student, and parent activists in Brownsville to tell this history as in the words of literary scholar Christina Sharp, quote, a method of encountering a past that is not past. And part of what is not past is the overrepresentation of white Jewish middle-class narrators of this history, such as myself, and so it feels particularly urgent and necessary that in doing this work, I disrupt my scholarly authority. 
So last academic year, I served as the adult historian in residence at an activist organization, Integrate NYC, which aims to draw attention to the persistently segregated nature of New York City public schools. And the historians team included myself, Jesus Martinez Montes, who was a high school student serving as the youth historian in residence. He's now a freshman at Wesleyan. Uh, and Joshua Ingram, an educator activist who liaised between our team and the broader organization. And each month, Jesus, Josh, and myself took on a topic in the history of education, Black liberation schools, indigenous survival schools, the model minority myth, and we dug into primary and secondary sources, wrestling with both the text itself and how it resonated with or challenged our own lived experiences. We were of different ages, different racial, ethnic, class, and religious backgrounds, and we had different relationships to the New York City public schools. And we called our weekly meetings struggle sessions because that's really what they were. And by the end of each month, we synthesized our collective struggles into a political education presentation that Jesus delivered to an audience of fellow student activists. So after spending this year struggling collectively to make sense of and teach topics in the history of education with the explicit purpose of furthering an activist organization's political analysis, returning to my dissertation work was challenging. Wrestling with texts by myself has felt like such an impoverished experience. I know that were I to sit with these texts in conversation with others, we would come up with much richer understandings, analyses, and arguments, and we would push each other to grow collectively in the process. Can one employ such a methodology in a dissertation? In the social sciences, participatory action research has become a popular attempt to disrupt these power hierarchies of researcher and researched. Thus far in American studies, I've rarely come across projects that intentionally do this. Of these, most are oral history projects, as Mary uh, mentioned, that attempt to share authority with their oral history tellers. But both participatory action research and oral history methodologies seem to be based on an assumption that folks outside of the academy only have expertise in their own lived experiences. What about shared theorizing, analysis, authorship? On the other hand, our program frequently engages in participatory public history projects, but these seem to exist largely as extensions of more traditional single author dissertations and books. How might we collapse this distinction between these collaborative projects and the more solitary research that precedes them? Could a dissertation be a collective act of knowledge production and dissemination? And this question leads me down a slippery slope. Because what if the collective concludes that a dissertation or research of any sort is not the intervention that's needed? In 2014, social scientists Eve Tuck and Kei Wayne Yang published a now classic article theorizing the act of refusal in research. And they challenged social science researchers to interrogate, quote, the hidden theory of change that research itself leads to change. And when I came across this idea a few years ago, I stopped in my intellectual, intellectual tracks. My work as a historian of education is premised on the insight that there is already tons of excellent scholarship on the history of education. And the problem as I see it is that the majority of teachers, students, and parents who interact with public schools lack access to this research. So given this premise, why am I engaged in producing more scholarship? How does cloistering myself in scholarly study for several years bridge the gap between scholars and the public? What is the theory of change here besides changing myself from a person without a PhD to one with this credential? I suppose my work could become scholarship that future political educators digest during their own struggle sessions. One can only hope but this feels like a distant and hypothetical response to the urgent educational injustices that organizations such as Integrate NYC are trying to tackle. Is this the most effective use of Rutgers copious resources? How does training scholars to write monographs lead to work that matters for the collective struggles we face? Does this work, guys? Okay, great. Um, thank you, Erin. That was great and much shorter than when we first went through. <laughs> um, so for my
my dissertation, I have assembled 12 border crossing women writers. As Mary mentioned, these are writers who have lived for at least five years on either side, both sides of the Canada United States border or in a territory that crosses that, that settler colonial boundary and have been published between 1990 and now. And I'm focusing on their memoirs and their novels and the thematic through lines of the work, which are uninhabitable houses, itinerant characters, and environmental threat. And my objective in studying these authors and their work is sort of twofold. One is to show that these writers who are overlooked in eco-criticism are actually engaged in literary environmentalism um, via something that I've termed intercitizenship. Um, and the second is to construct a methodological framework for collective knowledge production in eco-criticism that could eventually potentially lead to collective problem solving for the climate emergency. And the main dilemma in this prospectus, in this project, in academia overall, is moving between what I, as the white critic of these varied writers, think I see in their work and what I envision should be a new kind of literary criticism. Um, I'm really grappling with having a hypothesis, being able to make a convincing critical argument, proving that hypothesis, but also not wanting to project my assumptions about an author's positionality or an author's identity or an author's intent and not wanting to sort of participate in this traditional academic system in which an expert centers her voice and her opinion, makes claims or proclamations about others' work, um, and then benefits from it. Um, and it would be really irresponsible, especially in the case of the indigenous writers with whom I'm working, um, because I think that sort of qualifies as a renewed colonialism that I don't want to engage with. Um, to graph this mostly white, mostly male framework for literary criticism onto the women in this dissertation would be irresponsible. And I'm really hoping to engage with indigenous knowledge and critical place inquiry to make an argument about feminist ecological citizenship. And uh, more broadly, I hope to connect a writer's life experience to her written work and to her political power. Um, but again, I'm not comfortable coming to conclusions without authorial input. I'm not comfortable with the convention of making assumptions about identity or about incentive, however convincing the close reading may be for deducing either. Um, I believe that the web of fixes for the climate emergency will have to be collective and collaborative, a comprehensive cultural shift requiring a web of voices. And I really wanted my dissertation to serve as an example of a new method of eco-critical literary inquiry one that includes not just the writer's work, but also the writer in the analysis of her work. And my plan for making this happen was to interview the living writers who I attempted to study and hearing how they felt they embodied or expressed their position spatially, environmentally, nationally, emotionally, and so on. And I wanted to ask questions of these border crossing writers and to engage in discussion about their literature so that my voice and the voice sorry, that is the voice of the researcher and their voices, the voices of the writers would be intermingled in the practice of criticism. And my role would be more of like an assembler um, than an expert. And by assembling, I would be activating the work in a new way um, and thinking about how this act of grouping changes the work and the work's impact and how new meaning is made by making a collective um, rather than sort of like inspecting individually. Um, and then it would be together that we could draw these conclusions or, or together that we would practice this literary environmentalism. Because to me, literary environmentalism is an action, uh, an action to take. It's a way of reading and critiquing and becoming involved with the author to achieve her agenda. Um, unlike eco-lit in the, the more traditional sense, which is like a cultural artifact or a product. Um, literary environmentalism expands what qualifies as ecological writing, which means that women and black and brown and indigenous writers and others who have been excluded from the canon have a more central role to play. Um, so there's 12 writers who qualify as border crossers, uh, border crossers according to my parameters. I reached out to nine, two have passed away and one is sort of against interviews. Six white writers agreed to be interviewed, although I've since been ghosted by two of them. And three indigenous writers declined. And when they, did, when they declined, they did so kindly and with the assurance that my project sounded promising. But this leaves me with a choice. Either I see my aim of collective knowledge production through, but use only white voices and reframe this work as a white racial project or relegate the idea of collectivity to the conclusion proffered as like a hope for future study um, and stick to a more traditionary, traditional literary criticism dissertation. 
And I've asked myself many times, how can I make this problem productive? I do not think there's an attainable solution to the time-worn academic system of expertise and bureaucracy to be found within the confines of my dissertation. But I want, by at least drawing attention to the pro problem, to open up the potential to change it. Um, and I hope that by putting my problem to this symposium, um, we can generate some answers and that we can here together today practice a version of collective knowledge production that I was initially hoping for. Thank you. Hello. Thank you to both Aaron and Hannah for your lovely um, papers. Um, and good morning to you all. My project began as a research paper in 2019. I had just been introduced to the Montclair History Center and was intrigued by its multi-layered history as the homestead of the township's celebrated founding family, the Cranes, and the site of the nation's first YWCA established by and for black women. But what truly piqued my interest was the fact that the wise founder, Alice Huey Foster, didn't seem to have much of a documented historical footprint beyond her service and activism through the Y. While researching, I found a small mention about Alice and her sister Grace owning and operating a business on Bloomfield Avenue, a seemingly notable accomplishment for two black women in the early 1900s. But this fact seemed to be absent from most references to the pair. Another curious absence in local narratives about Montclair were the women serviced by the Y those working class black female migrants from rapidly industrializing city centers, rural Southern hamlets and sun-soaked Caribbean islands who helped the town's black population grow to nearly double that of Newark proportionally by 1930. Black women of all classes worked to uphold Montclair's identity as a premier suburban destination. Their service was key to maintaining the estates of the town's wealthy white commuters and to providing essential services to their own segregated communities. While their presence is acknowledged, their experiences navigating segregated northern suburbs are interpreted via the specific lens of social activism and racial uplift. Their lives and labors as Montclairians have not been fully contextualized or critically analyzed, which has helped perpetuate an uncomplicated and very rosy account of the town's establishment and growth. Today, Montclair boasts being most identified by its diverse populations, grand old homes, proximity to New York City, and its thriving art community. That's a direct quote from their website. But the township has long been touted as an idyllic suburban community, unencumbered by division and discrimination. Since its incorporation in 1863, Montclair's heritage discourse has been primarily propagated by local systems of power, read white Montclairians, to the exclusion of others. First, by the area's wealthy founding fathers, then the progressive town planners and civic boosters, and more recently, by local media and cultural institutions like the Montclair History Center. I aim to trouble the town's founding mythology by centering black women through the recovery of counter narratives that push back against Montclair's present founding story and dominant narrative of progress. Montclair's earliest generations of black women, named and unnamed, were instrumental in facilitating its present day psychic and social inheritance as an ideal suburb and historically racially harmonious locale. Their stories must be told to offer an accurate accounting of life in the suburban North during Jim Crow and to show the links between the past and the challenges Montclair faces today, like residential segregation and persistent income inequality. However, I'm facing a professional dilemma. Who am I, besides a historian whose credentials afford me a type of cultural and social capital to assert that Montclairian's public memory of their suburban utopia is lacking because it's a product of top-down discourse about heritage and not historical reality? Doing local history can be taxing and rewarding, but most of all, it's personal. As a Black woman whose foremothers worked in the private service industry, I am intimately connected to this work but I am not from Montclair. I was not summoned by the locals themselves to upend and question local heritage practices and their epistemic and material effects. And my dissertation is not a public humanities project. So how do I embark on a project about historical erasure and how power impacts effective interpretation without reproducing that same dynamic against the groups I claim to be serving? 
is it enough for me to research and write singularly, tapping into local archives and practitioners as necessary resources instead of collaborators, and then present my finished work, hoping it's well received and used as a springboard? If I value processual thinking, horizontal knowledge production and dialogue, is it possible for my dissertation to be imbued with those same tenets? Essentially, I'm pondering the elusive how of shared authority. In a format as unique and singular as a dissertation, how do I honor my commitment to collaborative storytelling and avoid committing the same erasure as previous projects? In a 2011 piece for an edited volume on public history practices, Michael Frisch opined on the phrase he popularized. We need to recognize the already shared authority in the documents we generate and in the processes of public history engagement, a dialogic dimension, however implicit, through which authorship is by definition, is shared by definition, and hence interpretive authority as well. We need to act on that recognition. So I suppose Frisch's admonition in my is my concluding question. Given all that I've explained, how do I act on this recognition? Okay, awesome. So, um, so Sydney, since you just left off with your question, maybe Aaron and Hannah, you guys could just restate what you see as your sort of essential questions um, that you would like to use as uh, conversation catalysts. Um, so Hannah, I don't know if you want to start. Uh, in conversations about this, but among us, I mean, we've talked about this a lot um, among us, but um, what we sort of are also struggling to with, in addition to the elusive how of shared authority, really well said, um, is beyond introducing ourselves up front in our academic work, how can we be more proactive about our own social positions in trying to um, generate a shared authority experience? Um, yeah, I guess mine was just if we're being trained to work by ourselves, then how are we doing collective work when we know that's what needs to happen? So, so now I think we'd like to, like I said, have a conversation. And, and Kyle, I don't know how it works with um, the questions that may come through via Zoom. Okay, cool. That'd be awesome. So, don't be scared. Questions or comments, Converse, comments answers. conversation. Or, or just brilliant ideas that figure out all of these problems. That'd be, that'd be well, welcome. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, number one, thank you. For, thank you for, for presenting us. I appreciate all of your work. Uh, I think when, um, when it comes to like shared authority, there's uh, this author, Max Liberon, and he talks about pollution as colonialism. And he works within something called the Clear Lab. And he's like, if I'm doing um, scientific work against pollution, how do I make sure that I'm not colonizing a Native community, even if, even if he is Native himself? Um, and so I can forward you all the article. But a part of the process is, if I'm creating knowledge about a community, how do I collaborate with the community I'm working with so that I'm not perpetuating this colonial relation? Um, and I think that might be useful. And it's uh, like a pretty handy document. Um, and I, I, and I, I guess as a question to the panelists, um, are there routes that you were taking where you met like, a, like you like where you took a route in your research and you're like, no, that's not gonna work. And a route where you're like, oh, I think this is promising, but I'm still trying to tease this out. Does that make sense? Sort of, okay. Well, just briefly, I mean, I think part, I feel like you sort of hit the nail on the head for exactly what I personally am struggling with in writing this dissertation. I feel like I had a really exciting methodological idea that I was chasing down and that sort of uh, walls went up in, in front of me as I was going down that road. Terrible metaphor, I'm so sorry. Um, but that's exactly it, right, is that I was really excited by this really promising idea of not having to be the only person writing my dissertation <laughs> and um, how incredible it would be to uh, have a document that, that both 
um, abides by these more traditional academic standards, but also pushes back on them uh, within the document and doesn't solve the problem, which is an ongoing problem with the system overall, but at least points or gestures toward the potential of collectivity. Um, and then, you know, now that those walls have gone up, what to do about it and how to achieve that in this document or not. Um, and what does it say if not? And how how does the not become productive or generative for my future work, for scholars' future work, for holding a mirror up to that systemic problem? Um, yeah. So I have kind of a, a story that I think kind of connects to your point, Esperanza. So when I started this project in 2019, Full Steam had really excited um, at the Montclair History Center doing archival research. And I found this document that had pr been produced very recently by a local historian herself, a black woman. Um, so I reached out to her um, as her documents were in an archive, which is public, you know, uh, public knowledge. Um, and she was very against helping me at all. She did not want to, I made it very clear that as a historian who values ethics and integrity, I would not take her work and make it my own plagiarize. I just wanted uh, to be led to more resources. Um, and I think her anger, which I, I understand now having taken a step back and been thoughtful about it, was probably related to this idea of ownership and authorship, right? Um, I'm again, I'm not from Montclair. She probably thought I was stepping on her toes. So in that moment, I think that is what really began this, this kind of um, this tension in my mind. I want to tell this story. People already see themselves as telling this story, but I don't think that they are being as rigorous or as critical as they need to be to make sure that history isn't just stagnant, that it can be a catalyst toward change. And I really think Montclair is a place that that can happen. So to your point, Esperanza, yes, there have been many times throughout this work where I have been like, yes, I'm on the right track, but then either an ethical quandary or um, honestly, the lack of sources written by these working class black women that I want to uh, publicize to the world, that is another uh, stopping point or delay that I've encountered. So. Yeah, there's been some really productive things that have come out of this work, but also some things that have um, caused me to stutter step. So, yeah. Um, whew. I guess uh, moments that have caused pause are constant. Um, you don't have to go very far to hear people talking about how sick they are of hearing white people talk about black and brown histories. Um, I would say that in terms of a concrete example of how I've tried to wrestle with that, aside from the, like, is pulling the plug the ethical thing to do, um, I've remained in community and conversation with Jesus and Josh, who I spoke about, who are dear, dear, dear comrades of mine, and other activists that I haven't named. And I've tried to share my work with them. So I will be like, hey, would you be willing to read this? Like, what do you think? And um, in general, those interactions have been productive and people have said, yeah, I think it's important. I think it's great. Like, this is what I think is important about it. Like, this is why, and this is what I think could be. So trying to incorporate folks authority um, into my work sort of on an ad hoc basis. But I also know that there's a complicated tension of white folks just like wanting people of color to like approve of our work. And then that makes us feel better about what we're doing. And that's not, where I want to be sitting either. So those are some things that come to mind. I wanted to just quickly um, respond to um, Sydney's comments, which made me think um, in a sort of different way about this. And maybe part of the problem is, it, well, this is an obvious thing, <laughs> but I'll still say it. Maybe the part of the problem is how we define community, right? Because it seems to me that part of the issue that you're raising, Sydney, is that you know the, often the reflexive way we think about the knee-jerk way we think about community is geographical, but maybe the way we need to think about community is shared values. And it sounds to me like the woman that you're talking about, the historian that you're talking about, didn't share the values 
your values for what counts as history or what counts as historical process or what counts as what's the goal, right? Like, at least in your telling, you know, the, the, this historian saw knowledge as uh, something that she produced to maintain a certain fiction about the past, right? So it could be interesting to think about, like, what would it look like if we thought about community in terms of values and not geography or positionality, right? So, I mean, and I think in left organizing circles, this conversation is being had all the time, right? Um, so like, well, whatever, I won't go down that road. Anyway, um, <laughs> but anyway, so it just made me think about that. Um, maybe part of the issue here is how we define the communities that we work with and what, me what does community mean? Sorry, please. Um, all this, I mean, you all have different relationships to your subjects, um, but there's, there is a personal connection, but also those roadblocks. And I'm trying to think about, like, you were literally, right, told no, in a sense, by a certain yeah. subject or potential subject. I just wonder about this idea of almost permission. Um, we, do we assume permission, right, mm -hmm. to tell stories? Is that appropriation or do we all have, do you all have? blanket permission to tell all stories. And that's a big extreme. So I'm just wondering how you grapple with this idea of, am I taking, uh, you know, stories? I'm, I'm unclear, right? It, it, how would you define community matters, but at the same time, there are people that live there that feel ownership. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I, I don't know that sense, but the idea of permission. Mm -hmm. Hello. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that's a really intriguing question. This idea of permission that again, I, as a, a black woman scholar, I think about that constantly because I, like I said, I do not want to become part of the, uh, the problem that faces marginalized groups <laughs> whose stories have been co-opted. Um, who have not been given the space uh, to tell their own stories and use them in the way that they want. Um, but then I don't know. I really, I don't, I don't know. I think I, I'm thinking out loud mm -hmm. in response to your question, because I think when we get into this space and we're running towards the finish line to get that PhD, it's because it is a credential, right? You're considered an expert. Um, but we encounter experts on the street every day, right? Anyone can be an intellectual. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have to have a PhD to narrate these stories. So the permission piece, I really, uh, it confounds me. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't know, somebody else wanna take the mic. Um, I think the idea of permission implies the existence of ownership, right? You need, you need, you're asking somebody for permission to engage with or to use or to question or to intervene on their expertise or their position or their identity or their story. Um, and I think it's sort of symbiotic with these questions of community and authority um, and ownership and permission. And I think that these, these, those ideas are what we're all grappling with in our different ways. Um, and I think it's the nature of academia to assume that there's a generation of experts and that it's your job to intervene in that expertise, um, whether that's about the content or whether that's about the method. Um, and asking permission in academia is different than asking permission socially. Um, and again, for all of us, we're at the crossroads of social questions, public questions, and academic questions. And this is, I think, the crux of what's made this so hard for us, um, because we all want to approach it ethically and responsibly and with kindness and with openness and sort of against the idea of um, there being a hierarchy of expertise in any of this. Um, at least that's 
I mean, I don't want to speak for you both, but at least that's been a real struggle for me. Um, and so I just, I guess I just don't ever want to drop the twinned relationship between permission and ownership. Mm -hmm. um, what's coming to mind is the idea of like invitation as permission. Um, there's a sort of ongoing joke saying about like which white folks get invited to like the, the cookout kind of in black spaces. And so I think my like strategy thus far has been to show up in organizing and activist spaces that I feel drawn to and to build relationships with the folks that are in those spaces. And if they're still inviting me to these conversations, if they're still inviting me to do work with them and collaborate with them, then that means something productive must be happening, you know? And that if those invitations cease, then something unproductive is happening, you know? And I, and I like to think the idea, of course, with all organizing is about relationship building so that I'm building trusting relationships so that hopefully someone would, you know, feel comfortable coming to me with like, hey, what's up, da 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 da. But at the end of the day, they don't have to, you know? And so um, my continually being invited into these spaces is a sort of permission to continue speaking in these spaces and speaking about these spaces. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, but it's fraught, you know? I, I have, uh, as I'm, as I'm saying that I'm, you know, critiquing it. So <laughs> I have one question very quickly. So from professor with Drew, uh, how do these ethical considerations apply to com communities with problematic or just wrong beliefs? I North Newark Italian Americans who say 1967 was the work of criminal outside agitators. And I thought of it a different way of when are other communities allowed to tell their own fictions rather than their own truth, right? Well, we might call these myths too, or I mean, heritage is another word for that. And, and you know, Aaron and I, I mean, we won't go into the details of this. We've been dealing with this with the project that we've been working on. And, 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 and I really appreciate um, uh, Dr. Strube's asking that question because I think one of the things we have to think about is people have ownership, have the ability to, to create their own narratives about the past, 100%. Not all narratives about the past are based in fact. Do you know what I mean? Like, and one of the things that I think we bring as scholars, which I think is a question that we had talked about a little bit when we met earlier in this week, you know, is like sort of what's the role of the scholar then? One of the things that we bring as scholars is a sort of a, a, a rigorous, hopefully, um, uh, thinking about what the facts are and an interpretation then based on, on that. Um, I want to shout out, I'm going to leave, obviously I want you guys to respond. I want to shout out though, um, Dr. Satter, who just published an article in the Journal of Urban History that folks may find interesting, which is um, in part about a center uh, at in Chicago that in since the night or in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, um, basically worked on behalf of community groups to produce data that the community groups wanted, um, activist groups, data around housing inequality and racism and uh, redlining and such. Um, and these community groups would go to the center and say, we need this data. And then the folks who worked at that center would be like, you got it, and then do that work. So anyway, I think it's an interesting model for what we're talking about. But I want to give you guys a, a chance to respond to Dr. Stroop's question about what, what happens when the community has wrong ideas or bad ideas. <laughs> so that's actually, that problem is, is the catalyst for my project, um, is the perspective I have on the most common narratives that come out of white Jewish spaces about what happened in Ocean Hill Brownsville, which I argue come out of very old anti-black tropes um, and are not based on a rigorous understanding of what happened. Um, and so I think this is where like in the Tuck and Yang article that I cited, they do talk about the need for research to redirect its attention towards the workings of power and so to not be like sort of fetishizing the sort of trauma porn that research can become um, and instead to be really looking at these colonial dynamics that we're describing. And I think that's what I'm trying to do. Um, and it's a, it feels like a, a, a difficult needle to thread. I think that 
Um, you know, I don't want to fully essentialize identity, of course, it's very complicated. And I think that something to Mary's point earlier about values is the need to establish certain base values, right, that your, your work is coming from. Um, so it's not like, oh, any person based on like what they look like or their background, like therefore, like what they have to say is more valid than anyone else. Um, but I think that because I think that's what I see in quote unquote, my community as defined by like whiteness, Jewishness is yeah, there's actually a huge debate amongst white Jewish people about like what happened. And I'm trying to surface that debate to sort of de-essentialize the narratives. Um, and what I've been told by uh, several black scholars that I've in engaged with is that's like where they want me to lean. Is they're like lean into the Jewish piece in particular because you know, part of the way that Black narratives about this kind of history are discredited is by this trope of anti-Semitism, right? Like any criticism from a Black person, Black non-Jewish person of white Jewish people is automatically anti-Semitic and you can't like go there. And so that as a Jewish person, like I can levy those criticisms, um, even though of course Jewish people get called anti-Semitic for doing that all the time also. So, um, you know, to a certain degree you get trapped, you know, in people's worldviews either way. Uh, but I think that, um, you know, in the example that Wittstrub, you know, gave, I imagine someone who comes from an Italian white working class background, like, might have more success, right, engaging with and trying to disrupt those narratives. And I guess I'm trying to do that from a white Jewish middle class perspective. Yeah, what came to mind with that question when you're trying to reconcile putting forth a more historically accurate narrative that contradicts uh, a locale, a community, a neighborhood's public memory of something. The historian, local practitioner, whomever has to really think about what is the purpose of the work that you're doing. And so for me, the purpose of this work is to not show white people the benefit of including or expanding the narratives that they've been telling about themselves to include black people. That's not the point of this, right? The point is to equip black, brown, and other marginalized people with the tools to use history to enact change. Because in Montclair, yes, the its characterization as this great placid environment that is peaceful and quiet um, is, uh, what's the word? It's negatively impacting the people there who can't afford these, these palatial homes, the people there who um, are experiencing um, inequity in the classrooms, um, it's the effects of something as trivial as a story are material for these people. So instead of thinking about it as just a narrative that Italian Americans in Newark have propagated about themselves, think of it as like, they have power that other Newarkers don't have. They have historically been using this power in ways that they can't even recognize. But me, I have the tools to recognize it. So I'm gonna give it to the oppressed so they can empower themselves, right? That's what I see all of our work. We're conduits, right? We're supposed to do this work, this scholarship to pass on to other people. And I think that's, that's kind of gets into the, the conversation about permission, being invited, ownership. I haven't been working with organizing groups. However, I'm hoping that this work will be shown, will be received as an act of love. Me hoping that you will take this and see, I'm not trying to step on your toes or, or rewrite your story for nefarious ends. I want you to see the ways that power have caused you to misinterpret your story. And in that process, that has continued to degrade not only your quality of life, but um, a whole bunch of other stuff. I don't know, but I'm getting really excited about this conversation. This is some good stuff. Um, yeah, I think that's all I have right now. <laughs> oh, question, yeah. Okay, so um, thank you for sharing where you're all at with your, your research, because it's fascinating to hear on this side, especially since we haven't seen each other in a long time. But um, and I think you're all at a point of maybe uh, redefining or refocusing how you're gonna deal 
with what your topics are because of these roadblocks or ethical dilemmas that you're, you're finding yourself in from this research. And I'm wondering, in kind of the broader sense kind of question for the group, and to not too partially imply my own issues and coming to it with my own problems, but is it a point of redefining what a dissertation can be? And I think Erin is kind of tackling this the most in what she's stating, but our new methods of creating this scholarship, what is needed to move forward in these kind of ethical and inclusive manners to kind of help these situations? Yes. <laughs> and perhaps elaborate. <laughs> Magic, all the tech people are like, yeah, turn it on. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm trying to reframe broadly how I think about universities as sort of resources. Um, there's something innately hierarchical about the creation of the university. And so it's very easy to get to like a burn it down point. Um, and I get there at least once a day. Um, but I think, what I've tried to do more, at least in my work, kind of tangential to the dissertation, is show up in spaces that are talking about these histories and just offer myself as a resource. Just say, hey, I'm here. I've read all these books. If people have any questions or would like access to library stuff that you can't get or would like, you know, help thinking through how to teach this, like, I'm here. And, um, Sometimes people do, you know? And then I guess that's back to what I was saying about the sort of invitation piece, right? Then I feel like I get invited into how to share these resources. And I think I would love to see the dissertation proposal process go through something more like that, where grad students who are being trained and so much in investment is being put into us that we are not just generating our projects based on their scholarly intervention. We talk about that all the time. What's the scholarly intervention? And then we try to like come up with another bigger picture intervention to make it like sound compelling. But like, what would it look like for grad students to be like kind of offered as resources to people um, and their dissertation projects are actually coming out of being invited to do that research on behalf of folks. Um, so that's one way I, I think about potentially re-envisioning dissertations as like offering of trained researchers to folks who can then benefit from that labor, right? So then Rutgers is essentially investing in that labor that's being invited to do work that we're not defining necessarily. Right, like maybe the idea could be for your exams or for your proposal, what's your idea? What's your scholarly intervention? Who are you in conversation with? And what's your practical invention? How is this going to exist in the world on the ground logistically? Like, what are you going to do with this? What's the action here? Right, but we don't come up with that ourselves, right? Yeah. I just wanted to say, like, because um, I grapple with the permission, ownership, invited question too being that I do study black queer history in Newark. Um, and I just wanted to say like, I think in some ways, like we have to think of ourselves as like people who have the time and are willing to like not get paid very much to like collect this knowledge. And so it's like a kind of like a question of caring. Like we care enough to take the time to do this. We care enough to be, you know, kind of broke <laughs> and also like a lot of people, it's not that they don't care, but they don't have the time or they don't have the means to be in school right now or you know, maybe they have to work several jobs. Like, So we are imperfect vessels, but we're here right now. And I think that the dissertation, I'm starting to think about it because so many of us are like, oh, nobody's gonna read this. But at the same time, like who cares? It is just pieces of paper. And it's like, we're the person behind it. So like, we're that vessel, we're more important than those papers. And it's like, it's this time that we have now to sort of like grapple with these really great questions that you're asking and like sit with it and put it on paper. And it's more just for us to like really uh, 
like etch it into our brains what we want people to understand about the world and um so it's like two halves of shared authority is like we have this knowledge like Erin said like we have we're a resource because we have the time to look at these like papers and essays that other experts have written but then the other half is like the community has their own expertise and knowledge and then we're taking that and collecting it and sharing it because as scholars, like, I know we all care that like other people get this. Like, it's not just like people that are at Rutgers or people that are in the academic spaces. And so like, I don't know, I just think it's like, we're bothering to ask the questions, we're bothering to try to find the answers, but we're not just saying we have all the answers. And I think that's really awesome. And I, and I really appreciate you all. And I'm glad I got to hear each of your work today. So thank you. I know we're running out of time, so I'll try to be faster. You guys were magnificent, so thank you. Um, I, the article I wrote that Mary referenced, the name of it, I think, is significant. It was called The Right to Define the Question. And that came from this group at Northwestern University that worked with activist groups and let them ask the question. And, but, and then they tried to find answers. So a community could come and say, you know, there's too many people in this neighborhood who are sick. We don't know what's going on, you know? And they would look at hospital records and determine, like, why are people going to the hospital? And what, you know, but the records weren't coded right, so they couldn't figure it out, so they had to recode them. And they determined it was nothing that more ho hospitals would fix, you know? <laughs> These were other kinds of issues, and they work on them. I mean, the point is that to answer the question that is asked, you have to sometimes work alone. And I feel like what you guys, there's been a little bit of emerging, like a blurring of the line. Like, um, Aaron, you talked about, well, you're trained to work by yourself. And some of you have said, you know, the PhD is just a pa piece of paper and it's just giving me a, a credential. And I want you guys all to give yourself more credit than that and understand that what you're doing is learning how to find out things. Whose interest that work is, is, is the big question. Not that you do the work in isolation necessarily because the solution to doing it in isolation can be just to kind of impinge on others too. Like, well, help me, you know, like they don't want to, like that was Hannah's issue. You know, like they have their own, you know, drives and their own needs. So I think you might need to accept that the training you're doing is of immense value and your job is to put it in the, in, you know, in service and it, it sounds complicated, but it's not as complicated as it sounds when there are organized communities that that need help, you know, so that you can, so the way it worked in the at Northwestern was that, you know, they would turn these questions over to grad students and the graduate students would research it. That didn't mean the grad student had to write a dissertation on it. A lot of them did, some of them didn't. They did whatever they wanted, but they had the skills. And that's what you're getting. And I want you guys to, um, give yourself a hand for the brilliance of your self-interrogation, but also for the skills that you are mastering that as Kristen just said, who has time for that, you know? <laughs> so don't merge those two things. Okay, thanks. Just to add one sentence is that how do you be as reflective and thoughtful and really brilliant as all of you are today about your own processes without letting it be personal? And I think, you know, um, and I, I think that's kind of what you're implying too, Girl. Um, she said without being paralyzed. I want to thank both Dr. Satter and Dr. Feldstein for those remarks because it made me it triggered a memory. Uh, my chair, Dr. Cooper, she told me that you are the best product of your dissertation. And I think that speaks to what you're both saying and kind of what, I don't know, a component of this, right? Like we are being trained to be of service to people and to make the change. So yeah, I think that's it. I just, we are also being changed in this process and we will be lights to the world with our, our intellectual work. So, yeah. I know we're over time, but I just wanted to say that, oh, all right, four minutes. Um, 
I think this defining of the question part is super important to me. And so that's where I guess to get back to what Victoria and some others had asked, I think there is something to me concretely problematic about how we're coming up with our dissertation questions. And I wonder what it looks like for folks outside the academy to be a part of that process, not for folks outside the academy to be on our committees. So they're constantly also in this process of like overseeing. I know in terms of the, to me, there's a, there's, there's like this Mobius strip of hypocrisy that comes up because I write particularly about sort of the black power movement. And so much of it was about who ultimately is overseeing this work, right? And so in Ocean Hill Brownsville, there were tons of white Jewish people doing work, but they were being overseen by the parents from the community. And so there's something about that power dynamic, like who's really holding the power overseeing the work that we're doing and what happens to it that I think there's a lot of room for change. So since we just have a couple minutes left, I just want to give uh, the panelists a chance to make any closing comments or any things that um, any ideas that were generated by this conversation. You certainly don't have to, um, but if you have any closing comments, that would be great as we wrap up. Yes, so I'm thinking about the work of Dr. Jennifer Nash. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> Um, and a few years ago, she wrote a piece about um, intersectionality and the way that it's been co-opted um, and the ways that it inadvertently cannibalizes Black women specifically in the academy. And I think her whole argument is trying to reframe it as an act of love. Um, and I think that's kind of, for, for all of the problems, and yes, I think we all agree that change needs to be um, enacted within these processes as we are being trained to be uh, scholars. However, I think it is, has been very helpful to me to think about the dissertation because I have been paralyzed, believe me, but thinking about it as an act of love um, for the communities that I value and that I want to see empowered because I'm also a part of those communities, I think that is something that I will take away. So thank you all. I mean, I guess I kind of gave some concluding thoughts just a minute ago. I guess I will say thank you to Dr. Satter and Dr. Feldstein who are on my committee. So we'll continue to have this very rich debate um, and Dr. Payne who's not here. Um, and I guess to push back a little bit on Ruth on your comment about paralysis, I think, I think it depends on where you're coming from. Uh, I come, my dad was a professor, like I come from a background where the schooling system that I critique has served me very well. And like sometimes stopping is I think what needs to happen um, for individuals and for institutions. So I'm not saying we all need to stop what we're doing right now, but I do think that this sense of like, well, we just have to keep going, like let's just keep it moving, sometimes actually can be what upholds these systems that are problematic in the first place. So that's a, a great closing comment because we actually do have to stop right now. But um, let me invite you all to uh, uh, thank our panelists for their amazing work and for their uh, really thoughtful comments here. And thank you all.
You're going to be on swag now where you've now signed over your images, so just know. All good. All right, everyone, we're going to move on to our next panel. Um, so as you see from your program, we have three PhD students, Annie Anderson, Esperanza Santos, and Erica Fuger, going to present their research and explain to us how it connects to our theme of scholarship that matters, and it'll be moderated by Professor Ruth Feldstein. So here you go, guys. Is this on? I hate mics. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> All right, hi everyone. Um, thank you all for coming out today. Um, okay. And um, just a few thank yous to, to Sonia and Kyle and to Alex for all their work putting this day together. We all really, really appreciate it. It's also really exciting to know that um, Judith Peterson will be here in a little while and to see her. It'll be great to have her back at Rutgers Newark. Um, and so I want to welcome you to this panel that we only recently named, <laughs> which is uh, Case Studies in Engaged Scholarship. Um, you know, I'm Ruth Feldstein. I know most of you, there are a few people here who I don't know, and I'll be looking forward to meeting people and talking to people afterwards. Um, I am going to introduce our presenters and then tell you what our plan is and say a few things about how we're going to do this. So Erica Fuger is a second year PhD student in the American Studies program. And she came to Rutgers Newark with a background in both oral history and peace education, which you'll be hearing more about. So in her previous work at Columbia University, she managed the Center for Oral History Archives and served as an Alliance for Historical Dialogue and Accountability Fellow. At Washington College in Maryland, yeah. At Washington College in Maryland, she directed the National Homefront Project, which is a World War II public memory initiative. And again, you'll be hearing more about this too. Here at Rutgers Newark, Erica um, continues to explore the lasting impacts of um, war and peace movements specifically. And right now she's working as a grad assistant for the Queer Newark Oral History Project. And she is one of the founders of a transnational research collaborative called World War II Peace. Um, Esperanza Santos um, is also a doctoral student in American Studies here at Rutgers Newark um, with a background in community organizing. And her um, focus both in her doctoral work and in a lot of your organizing too is um, transgender studies and Latina subjectivities and Chicana cultural histories and anti-colonial thought more broadly. And she plans in her doctoral work to write trans Latinas into history. And I think that's a fantastic sentence. So, you know, um, and a really, really important one. And um, her interests are um, critical Latinx indigeneities, borderland studies, and trans of color critiques. Um, Annie Anderson is also a second year American Studies PhD student. And before starting here at Rutgers Newark, Annie worked at the Eastern State Penitentiary Historic Site in Philadelphia 
um, doing research on the prison's history and on mass incarceration. And she developed exhibits, audio stops, public programs, and various social media projects so that Annie in that work has collaborated with academics, um, genealogists, frontline interpreters, museum visitors, among others. So here at Rutgers Newark, in terms of her academic work, um, her research interests include race, gender, sexuality, cities, vice, crime, and morality, connecting the past to the present, sharing submerged histories, and she does all this with a focus on um, progressive era Philadelphia. And here also at Rutgers Newark, she's assistant for Humanities Action Lab. Um, and Annie has supported the Rikers Public Memory Project, um, managing social media, producing podcasts, and supporting its oral history efforts. So what I just want to note, too, a few things is that the first panel, we're sort of going backwards a little bit, too, because our first panel was graduate students who have taken their exams who are into slash well into their dissertations. And our panel are all of you who are pre-exams, these ideas are still gestating. So I think that part of today's work is thinking about the content of scholarship that matters. And as I think my question to you guys also suggested, I think part of our work here today is thinking about the process of it too. So here we're engaging with an earlier phase of that process. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is that I feel incredibly lucky. I have had the good luck to have had all three of these panelists as students um, in seminars that I've taught and that I have learned so much from having Erica and Esperanza and Annie as students. And I would say the same for that matter for Erin and Sydney and Hannah, our previous panelists. And I just want to say it's, it's one of the great things about working at Rutgers Newark and having this job. So I feel very grateful to all of you from what I've learned. All right, so here's our plan. Um, each of our panelists is going to talk about their research um, for about 10 minutes. Um, so it'll be, a, you know, a little bit more of an explanation of what they're doing and making connections between sort of, again, I'm so intentionally using quotes between their sort of scholarly work and their other commitments, investments, activism to again get at our question of what does it mean to do ca these case studies and engage scholarship. After that, we're gonna do a little bit of reflecting back to each other and then we'll open it up to all of you. Um, okay, that's it. Oh, we, do we have an order? I'm so sorry. Okay, Eric is up first. All right, uh, well, good morning, everyone. Um, as Ruth kindly mentioned, my name is Erica Fuger. I'm wrapping up my second year uh, as a PhD student in the American Studies program. And I'm presenting today about the convergence of my work um, on public history and peace education, which is manifested through a transnational research collaborative that I work on kind of outside of my doctoral responsibilities called World War II Peace. Um, and I just wanted to Thank again, um, all of our wonderful uh, faculty and staff, and of course the other students. Um, Ruth has been a wonderful mentor and I'm incredibly inspired by uh, her teaching and scholarship. So I'm um, grateful to be here on the panel today. Um, so if I have a little bit of extra time, I might kind of come back to uh, showing some of the, the projects that were produced through this World War II Peace Initiative, but I'll, I'll wait maybe to the, the end of my presentation, see if there's a couple minutes left. Um, but essentially what I'm gonna go through today, um, as Ruth mentioned, it's a kind of the process of, of building a project and really thinking about um, creating scholarship that is engaged. So I'll be talking first about the background about World War II peace, kind of the mobilization efforts, and then grounding this kind of concept of peace within American studies and reflecting back on the, the scholarship that matters theme. So starting off, um, to give some background about my project, um, prior to arriving at Rutgers, I was working as an oral historian on the National Homefront Project at Washington College in Maryland. And um, my background is in oral and public history. Um, so I really kind of brought um, that commitment to working with communities into this particular public memory project. 
The National Home Farm Project um, collaborates with uh, community organizations uh, and families across the US to collect uh, and preserve civilian experiences of World War II. So this is one of the um, a photo of a couple of my students um, from Washington College who were interviewing one of the oldest living Rose of the Riveters, um, the women's war workers during World War II. And one of the impetuses for this particular project um, was that the World War II generation, um, you know, they were starting to pass away and that civilian stories and all of their complexity hadn't been recorded as much as veterans experiences. So this was required to provide a kind of nuance and balance to World War II history, um, which is one of the defining events of the 20th century. So as I was working on this project, um, I connected with institutions across the country that were involved in collecting and interpreting World War II. Um, and later I understand how much the war has become kind of intrinsic to American national identity and the kind of stories that we, we tell about ourselves. But what I especially found um, was that there was kind of a dark underside to World War II, which included human rights violations that were perpetuated during the war. And one of the most well-known um, is the, the Japanese American incarceration and often rural uh, concentration camp sites. Um, this is a, a photo from the Topaz um, camp in Utah. And um, World War II, you know, there was also segregation present within both the military and the home front during that time, um, including hate crimes and exclusion of black soldiers from the GI Bill after they returned from combat. So in addition to the horrific atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Japan, uh, the development of nuclear weapons um, during the war and afterwards also impacted many indigenous communities. From the Mescalero Apache near the Trinity test site to the forcefully uh, relocated peoples of Bikini Atoll in the Marshall Islands. So this speaks to kind of the far reach and violent complexities of American imperialism. And that all re <laughs> relates back to World War II history. Um, so while I was studying this era, um, I began to see how so many different elements, um, you know, kind of of our founding myths um, ran through World War II. And I learned about some of the resistance uh, to many of these human rights violations, uh, both during the war and today. So I, th I therefore ended up applying to a fellowship at Columbia University um, called the Alliance for Historical Dialogue and Accountability, um, which brought practitioners of human rights and transitional justice together from around the world. And this became a life-changing opportunity to deepen my own training in human rights and to extend beyond the borders of US history to see how justice often requires a transnational approach. Within this program, I ended up focusing on creating a proposal to update the National Home Front Project's interview collection policy to reckon with many of these difficult historical truths. Um, and one area that I came to focus most closely on was uh, connecting with organizations that um, interpreted Japanese American uh, incarceration. And I became especially inspired by the ways that Japanese Americans were using their community's experiences during the war in order to advocate in solidarity uh, for immig immigrant communities who are experiencing human rights violations today. Um, I attended some local community events in early 2020 um, in which I learned about a national march that Subaru for Solidarity was planning at Washington. Um, and I hope to offer some support for collecting oral histories of activists, um, but that really would have required some deeper inroads and collaborations. So unfortunately, the um, COVID-19 pandemic intervened in the realization of my kind of original fellowship project, which again was updating kind of the collection guidelines for the National Home Front Project. Um, I also began transitioning towards uh, this wonderful PhD program. Um, one difficult thing about COVID was that it hit some of the oldest generations of Mer Americans hardest, um, with my heart breaking every time, you know, the virus spread across nursing homes. But one thing uh, that COVID did do uh, was transition many communities and organizing spaces online in new ways. And as a result of my involvement with um, the Alliance for Historical Dialogue and Account Accountability, I received membership to a platform called the Bosch Alumni Network, um, which connected to an even broader uh, community of practitioners of human rights and peace building. So leading up to the 75th anniversary of the end of the war um, in 2020, um, a member of the peace cluster within this alumni network um, posted with an, an interest in hosting a global event discussing the legacies of World War II internationally. And this brief exchange in the platform 
kind of led into this whole larger um, research initiative that I'll, I'll go more in depth about. Um, so I, I subsequently became close collaborators um, with a psychologist and peace activist from Bosnia um, named Adis uh, Buganovic. And, um, and he kind of, you know, together we realized how World War II connected so much of the international human rights community um, through the shared history. So we organized an online dialogue series in fall 2020 to kind of explore these contexts further. What we found from by the end of this series is that World War II tends to dominate a lot of the historical conversation in Europe and the United States, that it also impacts ongoing political realities in East and Southeast Asia, and that there are hidden histories of the war across the world. The war impacted the international um, development of the United Nations, uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, war crimes tribunals. Um, but what was especially striking um, was the commitment to peace immediately after the war and peace itself remained a complicated term. Um, but finally, I'll just mention that from the series, um, we learned that many peace builders in the global South did not necessarily resonate with European or American framing of World War II history. Instead, they have uh, you know, community recollections of uh, the decolonization processes that followed the war um, it greatly has shaped the world in its aftermath. So therefore, um, my collaborator, Adis and I, um, we applied for funding in order to kind of launch a, a research initiative um, that trained these peace builders from around the world how to do historical research. Um, so I think this relates back a little bit to some of the conversations that were being had um, in the panel in the roundtable right before us, um, because how do we share this knowledge? How do we share these uh, skill sets that we are acquiring through our studies um, kind of with a broader, broader audience and in turn empower them to use them out in the world? Um, so that's what we did is that we kind of launched this, this uh, research initiative that include capacity building workshops in archival research, in oral history interviewing, in photography, so that um, this community of researchers um, could explore social movements, justice and redress efforts that were unique to their own local communities over the past 75 years. Um, we especially frame this program as a public history initiative um, that encouraged the researchers to build repositories of alternative knowledge um, by focusing on collecting multimedia materials, including oral histories um, and other documentary materials. So these peace builders were tasked um, with creating meaningful projects that they would share locally in collaboration with their communities. Um, they were also asked to present these materials back to other members of the Bosch Alumni Network and the public um, to redefine our understanding of peace and share resistant methodologies um, against the global systems of violence, war, and oppression. And so we're working on creating a global exhibition of these materials now that will be accessible digitally soon. Um, and just to share a quick uh, kind of summary, um, we had fellows from Azerbaijan, Italy, Zimbabwe, India, Bulgaria, Poland, and Germany. Um, and many of these uh, projects, you know, interacted with specific conflict histories, um, but also empowered, you know, women to speak up about their own versions of peace, um, to bring communities together that had been displaced um, due to decolonization, um, and to also kind of raise awareness of uh, different um, memory building efforts, um, kind of monuments and their histories as well. Um, and especially these brought communities together in new ways to talk about war and peace. So I learned an incredible amount from these researchers whose work continues to inspire me and help redefine my own understandings of peace um, beyond war, you know, towards striving for more just, equitable and harmonious societies. So I'm just gonna kind of wrap up here by um, how do you connect this kind of public history work um, to its grounding in American studies? Um, so I just wanted to take a moment and kind of thank um, different professors that have really kind of influenced my um, connections between these different you know, disciplines and modes of scholarship. Um, certainly Dr. Feldstein has been uh, kind of wonderful in allowing me to really think transnationally and how I um, kind of approach uh, working within activist spaces. Um, Dr. Chang uh, allowed me to really think about uh, colonialism and its many different forms, both domestically and kind of across the world. Um, and Dr. Chen um, really allowed me to look at US peace history and the ways that it is also part of a colonial project. And I'm also grateful for many um, faculty uh, within uh, the Global Affairs and uh, Urban Studies program 
who again kind of allowed me to connect some of these conversations across fields. And of course, uh, wonderful <laughs> public historians at Queer Newark um, really helped me ground, ground my work in a community uh, focused practice. So again, just wrapping up here, um, the way that we approach peace within um, this, this kind of transnational research initiative, we look towards a positive peace that looks beyond just the kind of war and conflict towards the attitudes, institutions, structures that create and sustain peaceful societies. Um, peace does not necessarily only have to be traditional institutional practices. It can also be uh, other forms like nonviolent resistance, which I have learned a lot about this semester um, in Professor Schock's class. And to me, then, um, all of this is an attempt to trace some of the connections I make as an oral historian and American studiesist um, and a peace educator between my work. Um, the US has been involved in perpetual wars and built systems of oppression from the founding of this country. We live in a society today that again is attempting to ignore inequities, perpetuate human rights abuses, ban books and suppress historical truths. And we need to find ways to communicate these complexities to the public and engage them in meaningful dialogue in order to dismantle these intertwined systems of oppression which you know, are global. So to me, this is what I consider a peace practice, praxis. <laughs> so this goes back to kind of the core questions um, from this symposium, you know, how, when, and whom, to whom does scholarship matter? What counts as scholarship? All of these really essential questions. And to me, um, you know, I wanna make sure that my uh, own work is kind of very, um, presently engaged, um, that it's in conversation with the past that looks to build a better future. And so at the moment, what we're, we're doing in World War II Peace is um, kind of developing the next stage of, of the program where we're offering capacity building workshops to peace builders and learning how to document war crimes, um, mobilize kind of international human rights standards, implement trauma sensitive approaches and learn how to train others in peace education so that they can go out to the front lines of um, you know, the conflict in Ukraine or other um, settings around the world and bring these different kind of skill sets, these different knowledges um, to their work and again, share them back with the public. So that's like a really firm commitment that we have. So I'll wrap things up there. Um, thank you so much for your time. And I look forward to um, Andy and Esperanza's presentations and to answering any questions in the Q&A period. Thank you. Erica, that was gorgeous. Uh, I, I don't know if, uh, I was pretty close to the screen. I don't know if you could see, um, but on the peace praxis, uh, one of the sticky notes read, que Dios perdone los Estados Unidos, uh, which translates to, uh, may God forgive the United States. Um, and I think that like uh, peace as a frame for thinking invites so much opportunity, like within the global South, within the global North, within Europe, like, you know, like it's kind of like a, this, almost like a poetic metaphor that can unite so many different contexts. Um, and can I ask you a question? Um, and I, 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 so I don't own a television <laughs> uh, or subscriptions to like a lot of news channels, but I watch Democracy Now! And I know that uh, there's been, they've really been covering Ukraine and what's been going on. And one of the things that uh, Russia has been claiming is like, no, like people are fine, like don't worry about, but one way that they're documenting war crimes is through satellite images of where there's like mass burials um, that people aren't noticing. Um, how do you, oh, do I ask, is it okay if I ask a question? Oh. <laughs> um, uh, how does this contemporary context of what's happening in Ukraine, which I'm calling World War 2.5, um, uh, speak to like either how you're shifting what you're doing or how you feel it's more powerful because you're doing it. Does that make sense? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And um, I think that definitely the war in Ukraine has given us, um, has mobilized the, the peace builder community um, in, in new ways and really shown that, um, you know, all the work that we've been doing and preparing for, it actually needs to be put into practice. Um, so I think that there's a lot of um, fear around the world that, you know, that that conflict will then um, create a new Cold War, it will develop into a whole kind of global um, <laughs> war uh, similar to World War II. Um, 
but I think that there are, at least what I've seen, is that there are people that are working to prevent that. Um, and that's what gives me hope a little bit. Um, and that we're trying to help um, really allow peace builders and members of the public to look historically, you know, why do these wars happen? Like, what is the actual truth um, that led to this current situation, the invasion of Russia through Ukraine? Um, so I hope that kind of all these different skill sets that, you know, I've absorbed uh, kind of, you know, working with in academic spaces, that that can be something I can pass along to, to the public and that, um, you know, by documenting these war crimes now, um, folks can be held accountable and that there'll be more accurate versions of history to write in the future. Um, <laughs> so if you want to argue next, is that, or, okay. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, hi, gorgeous goblin. <laughs> uh, so this is a work in progress, so please be gentle. Lightning without rain, fire without mercy. A dry storm voltage struck Apache land 49 times on June 24th, 1971 in Western Arizona. The 49 strikes blossom into a legion of fire called the Carriza Fire of 1971, of which gained notoriety as the worst fire disaster in the history of the Fort Apache Indian Reservation. After all, the feral flames charred over 50,000 acres. This caused fire control agencies to enlist 700 White Mountain Apache firefighters and commission another 1,300 foreign tribal and federal workers to battle the blaze. Ultimately, these efforts cost over 3 million federal disaster dollars to tame the wild sky summoned fire. Some tribal members share a sentiment of gratitude for the collective effort to put out fires to save the land, timber, and tourist attraction. As one Apache member of the fire controls team states, I'm glad the White Mountain Apaches have so many friends. The following year, reservation officials actively invited the community to practice, to practice fire prevention, lest there is a repeat, of the, and this is a quote, repeat of last summer's Holocaust. However, feelings of gratitude and caution were not shared unanimously. Um, and this is where I get kind of into the context of it. Um, so just kind of like, uh, that was like a, a, a snapshot of 1971. And I just kind of like want to expand and come back that in our contemporary context, uh, prescribed burns, did, uh, should I explain prescribed burns? Yeah, okay. So um, at least within, oh, no, okay. In a lot of places, prescribed burns denote how in order to prevent massive wildfire, you should do smaller burns to make sure that you get away with the brush, so that way it can't build the fuel to ignite something major. And oftentimes, in our context, prescribed burns are defined as uh, a Native American cultural practices that can now be conveniently brought back to help fight climate change and wildfire that threaten the capital and the property of people who are nearby. And so this is kind of like my, like, moment of intervention. So there's these feelings of the reservation, um, and then there's this feeling from this historian. Some scholars lament the conditions that created the fire and the tribe's missed opportunity for progressive fire practices. So you have this uh, tribal nation that is practicing, or in part practicing fire suppression to protect their resources. And here you have this historian saying, this is a missed opportunity. And so there's like this productive tension for me of like, wait a minute, if prescribed fire is quoted in the contemporary context as a native practice, why would a native community want to turn away from this? Stephen Pine, um, he's like the major historian. And other scholars note that prescribed burns would have prevented the massive fire of 1971 
and that the, quote, fire revolution of the early 1970s would have been a good opportunity to reintegrate fire into native forestry practices, uh, but instead the tribal nation did neither. For a time, and this is like the key part, Arizona tribal nations were the leaders of prescribed burns, but then they became obscured from national eyes and retreated to traditional federal forestry, forestry practices of fire suppression. So I'm investigating like, why did this community do this? Um, so my, the questions that animate my project are, while segments of the United States were returning to prescribed burns during the fire revolution of the 1970s, why did Southwest tribal nations who were the premier practitioners of prescribed burns go against prescribed burns? After all, if prescribed burns are cited as traditional cultural practices, wouldn't tribal nations seek to maintain the land as they have before? Question. I'm talking as if like, yeah. Uh, the historical tension is crucial because it arrives at a much keener question. What are the colonial and anti-colonial relations of fire? This paper argues that fire practices have been used as a tool of colonization within forestry and conservation work. Um, and something that I'm like teasing out is exactly um, when I when I think about a tool of colonization, what are some of those characteristics? Um, and then you find a very large <laughs> set of literature. Um, but just uh, in brief, um, so some characteristics of colonization are the political and legal domination um, over a society, relations of economic and political dependence, exploitation um, between imperial powers and the colony, and racial and cultural inequality. Uh, within the United States, um, there's something, we, we call it like settler colonialism, and that's been developed more like, I want to say in the last 10 years. Um, and the, I mean, there's also extractive colonialism, neo-imperialism, and internal colonialism. Um, and something you can ask me in, in my Q&A is like, Esperanza, like, talk to us about that. <laughs> um, but for now, I'll say that uh, one incredible scholar to check out um, that I recommended one of their papers to the first panel is Max Liberon. Uh, Liberon? It, I, think, I think that's how I pronounce it. Um, they're Metis from Canada. And they have a book out called Pollution is Colonialism. If you read the introduction, they talk about different types. They, they talk about how environmentalism connected colonialism. Um, and it's, they're, 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 they're a fun writer to read. Um, and if like some of their major, some of the people they are in conversation with is red skin, white masks. Um, that's in response to Fanon's uh, black skin, white masks. Um, and they also cite extensively, decolonization is not a metaphor uh, by Eve Tuck and Wayne Yang. Um, and so those are just kind of like to get a picture of who, who am I citing. Um, and so when I think about environmental and colonialism, I'm specifically addressing the infrastructure of tribal nations as wards in which even if they have land, they, uh, federal forestry practices dominate and they're not able to have as much consent and it's what they do. Um, and so they can't always manage it alone. Um, that there's an assumed access to tribal nation land through forestry and the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the manufactured poverty and diminished access to their own resources that make it so that they have to be more ingenious in how they keep their community economically afloat. Ah, two more minutes? Okay. Um, so I'm just gonna feed through a lot of this. Um, uh, but I, the, the things that I wanna get to are like, okay, Esperanza, so why the Southwest? Like, who cares? Like, the United States is pretty big, right? Um, and so this is pollution, is colonialism. It's really gorgeous. Um, and so, with the Indian land holdings, the Fort Apache um, holds a lot in the in the first diagram. They have 1.6, what 1.6, I think, acres of land. And in, interestingly, a lot of the Southwest nations do not have allotments. 
and so it makes it so that the BIA forestry targets more Southwest nations than any other location. And when it comes to Arizona, like more than a quarter of the land in Arizona is owned by a tribal nation. Um, and as it connects to Mexico, um, the Tono Otam nation is cut by the border. Um, and so there are some tribal nations like the Tono Otam and the Yaqui who like are one people that were cut by the border. Um, and the, the thing that I would like to make sure I share is um, Native communities had to use timber on their land as a form of capital to stay economically afloat. And so while not directly about fire, indirectly, they had to make sure that they were practicing fire suppression to protect their timber as a tool to stay economically afloat. And because of the manufactured poverty that the United States has um, connected to tribal nations, um, there, a, 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 a not big history that I uncovered was that the Civilian Conservation Corps had an Indian division in which a part of it was to develop infrastructure for tourism so that nations, so that nations could have economics. But a part of it was also to set up architectures of fire suppression um, to protect those interests. Um, and the, the last thing that I want to finish up on um, is, so the Southwest, this is the Southwest. Um, this is the tribal nations. Um, and, it, and in the 2020 context, this is what's like susceptible to fire. Um, and a huge part of that is the overlap with the Apache reservation. Um, and so I, I think one thing I was, what, well, the thing I'll finish on that I'm not gonna be able to elaborate too much here, but um, I felt like an academic who was writing a tragedy about a community who was unable to practice something um, because they had to survive. And uh, I was like, I don't know if I like this story. And if I prevented this to a room full of Apache people, I think they'd say like, okay, that's one side, like, so what's next? Um, and so a part of this is within the records, something that popped up over and over again was that there was a lot of Native American firefighters. And so from some perspective, these are people who kind of embody fire suppression and people who um, are turning away from native fire practices. But um, the wage labor that began in 1954, um, but is diminishing now, and I can explain later why, um, but it started in 1954 that came out of the, civil, the, the Indian Conservation Corps, um, is that Native Americans provide cultural and financial capital to reservations where oftentimes native people have to put on regalia and act native and perform nativeness and like, you know, like do this like dance monkey dance kind of a scenario for people outside the community. But here's a woman who is exhausted, has worked 26 hours, um, is providing for herself and for her family. And although she may not be exactly in the tribal nation, she's entered into the public imagination where she has power as a native person, not just within her regalia, but also through her labor. Um, that's it, thank you. Thanks, can y'all hear me? Great, thanks Esperanza, that was great, really interesting. Um, the last slide was making me think how uh, in contemporary California and the West, a lot of incarcerated people are used to fight fires and they're paid uh, really, really, really minimal wages. Um, and so they're providing a sort of human capital and labor, um, but being exploited as they do it um, and sort of being put on the front lines of climate change. So uh, that popped into my mind looking at your last slide, but my broader question was about your methodology. It sounds like you're using archival sources and uh, theoretical sources, but I was really struck by your title, Fire as Colonization. It's sort of like a, like a metaphor or a simile. And I'm wondering if you are using any other literary sources or anything else that, that by indigenous writers or other folks who are 
looking at fire as a broader theoretical framework. Yeah. Uh, so there's uh, this, um, they're not an indigenous author, but they work within indigenous communities. Um, there's a, their name is Alex Zahara. And like, w for, they're doing it more within like the last like 20 years. I'm doing more like a historical cultural history. And they're doing more like a, what does STS stand for again? It's like with science and techno science technology studies, I think. Um, and so what they do is like, they say, okay, the, Native communities are cool with fire, but the way you're doing prescribed burns actually damages Native communities instead of helps them. And so let's let, let's take a, like a moment to examine that. Uh, I think for like, there's no, not too many people are doing this because I think a lot of times it feels like people are there to either save property or to do things more efficiently from an economic perspective. But I haven't found too many people doing this from a cultural social perspective. Wait for it, wait for it. Come on back, come back. All right. Bam. Hey everyone, how's everybody doing? Good. Um, I'm just uh, moving my slide forward. Give me one moment. There we go. Hi. <laughs> um, good afternoon. It's uh, afternoon. Thanks to Kyle and Alex and Ruth and Esperanza and Erica for sharing this event and organizing this um, today. I'm really excited to talk about my research. Um, thank you for coming. So I've been developing uh, this work in a transnational research seminar and in an independent study with Dr. Feldstein and a eugenics class with Jack Chen. So um, some of you might be sort of familiar with my work uh, or parts of it. But my work sort of um, focuses on vice, crime, sexuality and policing in progressive era Philadelphia. So generally speaking, 1890 to 1920, and my dissertation will continue this work, um, combining my interests in urban history and surveillance with my commitments to archival research and public history. My research pivots from the 1913 Philadelphia Vice Commission, the front page of which is on the screen here. Um, and just behind it is another related local publication about sexuality and morality and delinquency um, published in 1916. So the Philadelphia Vice Commission was appointed to study sex work, um, gambling, drug use, and other illicit trades. And I argue that the commission articulated the progressive era's major cultural concerns. Gender and sexuality were identified, cataloged, and reconfigured. Municipal rhetoric was mobilized against vice syndicates and machine politics. Whiteness was shored up amidst a huge influx of immigrants, and Europe became a pilgrimage site uh, for reformers, many of whom informed by eugenics saw it as a site of racial purity. So my research is thus both local and aspirationally transnational. Um, I offer up a focused micro history and at the same time I locate Philly within a transnational and translocal context. So Philadelphia was one of at least a dozen US cities that formed vice commissions between 1910 and 1915. They included New York, Atlanta, Chicago, Portland, Oregon, and Newark, New Jersey. Anti-vice activism crossed national, regional, and municipal borders with prolific reformers, including some Philadelphians traveling to Europe and the Texas-Mexico border on fact-finding trips related to vice suppression. Um, I'm especially invested in recu recuperating the stories of those 
being reformed and policed, um, though not surprisingly, those voices are a little bit more difficult to locate amidst the, the wealth of court and police and carceral administrators who left paper trails and local archives. So um, while my approach to this history is primarily rooted in archival uh, research, I'm trying to think in an interdisciplinary way. Um, a long-term project rooted in the archive that I've been doing is documenting people convicted of sodomy in Philadelphia's courts in the early 1900s. And in doing so, I've, I've started mapping an early 20th century queer sexual geography beyond the heterosexual commercial sex landscape that concerned vice in inspectors. Uh, and recently I ventured to Slayton Farm, which is an abandoned girls reformatory built in rural Delaware County outside of Philly during the progressive era. And I was collecting some sound samples and documenting the decay of its cottage style architecture. Um, this is Slayton Farm today. There's its front administration building and its abandoned and glass broken caved in greenhouse. Um, but the site is a, about 10 to 20 acres of abandoned buildings, crumbling paint, stacked lockers, deserted chicken coops, all with this Pennsylvania stone schist, schist stone architecture and uh, green and white institutional color scheme. Um, my reason for going to Slayton Farm is that the superintendent, Martha Falconer, was on the Philadelphia Vice Commission and she was a career reformer. She advocated for institutional and carceral reform for women and girls, even as she called for more surveillance and policing powers. Um, she left Slayton Farm in 1919 and moved to New York City. And she had um, a, a long reformist career later working for the American Social Hygiene Association. Um, so this is how it started and this is how it's going. I couldn't, I couldn't resist the meme. Thank you for chuckling. Uh, this is me moving out of the archive and into the field. Maybe it shows like a general decaying of my scholarship or just a fun and interesting new direction. You can tell me during the Q&A. Um, but in all seriousness, as a scholar interested in public history and public memory, I want to be site specific and I want to interpret stories of immorality, vice and crime and the ways in which they linger in the landscape and the ways in which they provide prototypes and through lines to today's mass criminalization and hyper surveillance project in Philadelphia, which is one of the highest incarcerated cities in the nation. So that gets to my larger idea for this symposium. Um, sorry. Which is uh, how, when, and, and to whom does my scholarship matter? What does publicly engaged scholarship look like? Uh, these local stories that combine morality, eugenics, hyper surveillance, and delinquency have almost no local memory. In Philly, the city's official public historical memory is mostly relegated to its colonial and revolutionary eras. And as a scholar interested in public history and public memory, how do I frame and remember stories of so called immorality, vice, and surveillance? The historian Thomas Leonard calls progressive era reform movements an unstable mix of compassion and contempt. So what are best practices for presenting and interpreting these contradictory and complex histories? I think we can link progressive era anti-vice projects with modern alcohol and drug prohibition laws, anti-sex trafficking and anti-sex work legislation and de decriminalization schemes. But what would a vice memory scape or a punishment memory scape that accounts for the intersectionality of race, gender, sexuality, and class look like? I can imagine my work living alongside the work of other scholars interested in how gender, sexuality, and surveillance intersected in an East Coast city in the late 1800s and early 1900s, and how these identities and issues are remembered and forgotten. As far as I can tell, no other scholar has used the Philadelphia court system's bills of indictment and court dockets to unearth marginalized sexual subcultures in progressive era Philadelphia, or to pay much attention to the multiracial working class sexuality being surveilled and punished by state actors and state adjacent actors in this era. Just a handful of people, including Callie Gross and Michael Cahan, have studied progressive era Phillies, criminal and sexual subcultures. And I'm excited to build on their work, to offer something new and to link as Callie Gross does, the historic over-policing and intense scrutiny of women, people of color and LGBTQ people with today's systems of surveillance and mass incarceration. 
thanks for listening. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Um, really great presentation. It's been wonderful to see your uh, work kind of develop over the past two years of, of our coursework in the program. Um, you mentioned that, uh, you know, there was this kind of balance within um, the progressive mo movement of compassion and contempt uh, or tension or um, I'm just wondering, like, how do you kind of balance that in your own scholarship or like what kind of approach do you want to bring to um, the archives? You know, is there a different form of compassion that you might bring to telling your stories? Is there a way that you try to counteract the contempt and how you um, kind of bring these uh, memories and subcultures um, from the ar archival places that were uh, kind of created by these, uh, you know, colonial and oppressive systems? That's a that's a complicated question, and I don't know. <laughs> I don't really know how to do it. Or, I don't really know what I'm doing. I mean, I kind of do, but um, <laughs> I think, yeah, having like an ethic of care, I don't know, I kind of, not to deflect um, and not to put you on the spot, Sydney, but I wanted to ask a question like this to you actually during your presentation. Um, how do you, I, I, I guess like, what, what does shared authority look like when you're working with historic actors who are dead um, or in the past and like, how do you do that? Um, I don't know. I thought about that a lot when I was at the historic site I worked at and kind of unearthing like queer histories and like, is there, an, what are the ethics of like outing historic actors? And is that even a thing? Should I be concerned about that? Um, I don't know. I think just thinking through that question helps me do better work and helps me care for the, the people that, um, come into my purview, historic or otherwise. Um, yeah, I guess just sort of reading carefully and knowing that there is a lot of contempt and surveillance and like colonization projects and state power vested in, in the archive that I'm looking through. But that's, I think that's a question I'll be <laughs> puzzling over for the next several years as I do this project. Yeah, next year's symposium. Great. I'll I'll have an answer by then. <laughs> yeah, and um I just first of all thank all thank you all of you. These are great presentations. And I should have said this at the outset, but um so our panel was was um a little bit random. <laughs> so um Erica and Esperanza and Annie um submitted their paper proposals and then Kyle put us all together. Um, so in contrast to the previous panel where you could really feel the um, pre-given thematic coherence, and we were talking about it before, and this is one of the reasons we wanted to have each of them ask another, the other a question, was to start that process of forging links. Because sometimes it can be really productive to have that kind of thematic coherence, which we had in the previous session, which was amazing in part for that reason. And sometimes it's through these unlikely juxtapositions that other kinds of important conversations can be had and um, connections can be made. So um, our panelists, you know, invite those questions from you with that in mind about some of the connections. I have some ideas that maybe I'll come to at the end, but we want to hear from you at this point. Thank you. No, this is really interesting. and. Um, so thought provoking. And um, so I have uh, just a comment and then uh, that's always like a terrible way to start. I have a comment, like, no, not be, don't be that person. But, I want to, uh, but then actually, and then also a question. So, I mean, my comment, I was thinking um, Esperanza in terms of your project, which is so fascinating to think about a fire um, as, a, as, a, as colonialism. And it made me think about uh, several years ago when I lived in Philadelphia, there was a public history project there called um, like the public history bus or something cl close to that. I'm not remembering exactly right. And what this woman did is, she used this this bus and she would like drive around and like set up camp in a in a community in a neighborhood in Philadelphia and then like work with the uh, those community members to um, have them define a public history project that they would like to see. And in North Philadelphia, or maybe it was Kensington, the project that they were really interested in that community is interested in was the history of fire in Kensington because there had been a 
um, really devastating fire that had like destroyed buildings, killed several people, killed firefighters, and had really like marked the community. So I think it's if you if you're interested in like um, thinking about fire as like a longer term project, I think it could be really interesting to think about the contrast and juxtaposition of the histories of fire in the sort of rural, more rural areas versus fire as an urban phenomenon. And there's a dissertation recently that in an article um, recently about fire and gentrification in Hoboken, New Jersey. I think it's Hoboken. Um, any case, so anyway, I just wanted to mention that because I thought it would be interesting if you if you want to continue on this path. The question I had, because it seems like one of the themes that all of you guys are, are talking about um, is certainly about colonialism in its various forms. Um, and then also in, in each case, transnationalism. Um, and one thing I wanted to ask you all about was the issue of language, right? Because um, obviously English as like the lingua franca is a form of colonialism and colonization. And each of your projects, um, since it has a transnational aspect to it, um, also, I assume could mean that you are coming up against linguistic barriers. Like, so like Annie, for your stuff, like I'm thinking like, were there community newspapers that are in like other languages that might reflect some of these issues around uh, vice from a different perspective? Or, um, you know, Erica, certainly your peace building work is transnational. So how, so I guess my question is how, how does language play into the work that you're doing um, either up until this point or how do you think it might play in going forward? I can start off with that. Um, so that it's definitely a uh, consideration we had from the start of our project because it's such an international group of peace builders and then they're working within very diverse communities within their own countries. Um, language was definitely something on our minds. Um, so we kind of, this platform that we're a part of, like this, this network of peace builders, English is the general language that's used. Um, but we didn't want to impose that. And there's, there's so many power dynamics that, that go into that, um, both within academic spaces, also out in the world. So we really encouraged um, the peace researchers to use the local languages, um, you know, to record interviews, um, to work across interpretation or translation um, where needed, and then to find meaningful ways to present the material back to the communities um, they were a part of and continue the conversation. Um, but it did require, you know, a translation of all that knowledge um, back to this global English speaking audience. Um, and so I think now that we're designing a digital exhibition of these materials, um, we're definitely going to have to think a little bit about how um, to make, you know, the, I guess, the knowledge um, valuable to those communities again, and to also find ways to kind of connect um, all of this information to an English speaking audience as well so that it, it becomes kind of a global conversation. Um, but it's definitely a tension that we're continuing to navigate. And there, like I said, there are very many power dynamics that go into that and relate back to these uh, you know, themes of colonization as well. <laughs> okay. Um, sorry, I didn't say this earlier, but um, number one, thank you for the gorgeous question. Um, and that reminds me of uh, the, the, the burning of Malibu. Um, the, it was a, an environmental, justice piece that basically was like, hey, Malibu should burn because all these rich people are there and it burns all the time. So why is it, it was written by an incredible Marxist. Um, uh, and so just really quickly, um, I use she, her pronouns. Um, I am Mestiza, uh, Mexican from Zacatecas, Mexico. Uh, and thank you to the Lenape people for letting us be on this land. Um, and I was raised on Kumeyaay land and also lived on Pomo land. Um, so, Oh, like, okay, so you just, like, with that question, you kind of, like, solved a kink I was having in my brain, um, because I was getting really frustrated with, like, who is, like, writing all this fire history, and who are the references, and, like, why are these, why are these references the way that they are, and it reminded me of um, a resource I didn't mention, but is a part of my research, is there's a documentary called the Apache A, which is about the a Native American firefighting women um, who were a, a part of the Fort Apache Reservation, and they, they tell their stories of like, how did they get started? What was it like? What does it mean now? And in the beginning, um, a, a woman who I interviewed, her name is Katie Ade, uh, she was talking about how in the beginning, she didn't want to leave her family to go into Christian residential schools because she like wanted to be with her family. Um, but her family was like, no, like you have to learn English and you have to like learn how to like navigate the system and you have to like learn their ways because we have to survive. 
and a part of the process of preserving themselves. And even as, as I say this, like, I'm already, like, messing up, so please be, like, like gentle with me. But, like, sometimes, like, a part of self-preservation is assimilating strategically, and a part of that is language. And when it comes to the documents, the documents that I examine are primarily in English, not the Apache people whom have, like, astronomically high uh, levels of their, like, native language. Um, I think, like, and this is more a question of, like, the access to resource, but um, I know that I could use Spanish documents. When I, I had a conversation with Stephen Pine, one of the historians, and he was saying, like, yeah, like, the Mexican people across the border, like, they don't have wildfires the way we do. Like, across the border, like, we suck. And here, like, they're, 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 they know how to do it in a way that's not, that, that isn't informed by U.S. forestry practices of pyrophobia as a way to control Native communities. Um, so uh, Spanish is a, also a good direction. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question, Mary. Um, I remember, Ruth, you told me to, when I was working on this paper a year ago, to look at community newspapers with their own takes on vice and surveillance. And um, I, I haven't found any yet, but maybe they exist, and I just have to keep digging. But in terms of language, there's like a whole discourse in Martha Falconer's um, publication. She's the superintendent of Slayton Farm, now abandoned, about like feeble-minded, imbecile, um, gen like not using the word genetic, but basically meaning genetic. So there's a, a different kind of language that's very like eugenicist. So there's like the language on the surface of the state document. And then there's like the other language that's happening within the document. And I sort of need the key of like Jack Chen's eugenics class to open up that door to then allow me to see this other language that was being used. Um, so yeah, I was, I've been thinking a lot about the language that's there um, and then like what kind of frameworks that that language is setting up that's it's still, you know, English, it's the same language, but it's a different kind of um, discourse that's happening. And then I guess also, I'm just thinking about what you just said, Esperanza, that, um, or about, your focus on indigenous people. And there's like an, an interesting indigenous confluence in my research too, and that the Carlisle Indian School, which is outside of Harrisburg, was like funneling girls to Slayton Farm for delinquency and immorality. Um, so I'm, I was just thinking about some of the girls that were in that web and like what kind of other languages they brought to their, to their life experience too. Thanks. Thank you all so much for your inspiring talks. Um, Esperanza, I have a question for you. So I know that your larger focus is on um, the liberation of and giving voice to trans Latinx women. Um, so how do you see this work with uh, the concept of fire as colonialism um, being linked to your larger project and what you aim to do as a activist scholar? Thank, thank you. And also, if y'all want to answer, like, how do you see this as part of your larger project? Like, go for it. Um, so I think, like, uh, so my, my family makes fun of me because I talk about stories for a long time, and they're like, get to the point. Um, so I, I think for me, like, this project is part of a reaction to what I felt angry about within a couple of different disciplines, um, at least, like, within, like, Latino studies and Latino literature studies and within um, transgender studies, like, and, uh, so, and and I think a part of this was, like, also, like, inspired by, like, the essay, like, decolonization is not a metaphor. Um, within Latino studies, we talk about uh, decolonization quite a bit in, in discussing internal colonialism. And here I am at the crux of, like, okay, we're talking about decolonization, we're talking about like decolonial thought, and we're also like talking about like like how how do how do how do let the next people think about that in relation to and in connection with um, native communities who are in the United States, and uh, I, I, a part of that is in 2017 there was the critical Latinx indigeneity, which like more closely examines the relationship of uh, like indigenous and caste differences 
within Mexican people or Latin America broadly. Um, and I guess like sometimes I feel like the the deeper I go into trans studies, like the wider I feel. And as a my my resistance to that is okay, like if I care about native communities and if I'm thinking about hemispherically, we are like connect we are we are one people that are just separated by borders, then I have to do my diligence to learn about native communities in the United States. Um, because otherwise I'm gonna I'm gonna be ensnared within Latino studies that's like masculine and cis and avoidant of indigeneity. Um, and so I think I, a part of me wanted to pay my dues. And a part of me wants to like explore Latinx native relations within trans studies. Um, but there's just like not that many of us. And the ones that are there, I see dropping out pretty quickly. Um, and so like these are kind of like conversations that I hold in my brain. Did I answer your question? Thank you very thoughtfully. Yeah. Hi guys, thank you for sharing with us. That's really, it's all, this is always great to hear what everyone else is working on when we don't get to see each other. So uh, I appreciate all of this. I have a specific question for Annie, but I'm wondering how this also relates to the rest of your work. I was really fascinated by how you went from the archive to the field work. And the photographs of these places now give kind of, uh, kind of a poignancy and kind of like time passing momentum to it. Um, and I was also intrigued that you said you're getting sound samples as well, you're getting audio samples. So that's really cool and I wanna know more. But, um, and I also am curious how that relates to, cause I know uh, having visited uh, Eastern State Penitentiary, how they use sound there and how that's kind of a fascinating element that more museums should be doing things like that. Um, but in general, I guess my question is then for all of you is how does field work kind of bring you into the now of what you're studying. And a find a question in that, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I guess it, in my case, uh, I actually haven't met any of my collaborators in person ever um, because these, this project was mobilized during the pandemic. Um, and or transnational, um, but we were hoping to meet up this summer. Um, and then the war in Ukraine broke out and um, that essentially has shifted our priorities elsewhere so that we're still kind of organizing um, remotely. Um, so I'd say, you know, as a, a public historian or an oral historian that likes to be out in the field, um, that likes to have these kind of uh, personal connections with people, it has been challenging. Um, but I also have been able to experience the stories um, through the researchers that are working within their own communities um, and kind of creating multimedia materials that really bring, um, you know, stories of resistance, uh, stories of um, like decolonization and, and so many different kind of approaches, they really bring them to life through their own field work. Um, so I guess I'm trying to support others um, to do that kind of really important work and get their hands dirty and be out on the ground. Um, but I do feel some of that tension within within my own self as someone who's helping kind of manage the project um, to not really have that that in person time. So that's definitely something I hope to be able to explore further in the future. I have sort of a thought, um, and I should say by sound studies, I just meant like um, you know clicking record on my iPhone and like yeah. recording myself. Um, I have like no training in that, but yeah, thanks for this. Um, yeah, there is like a, yeah, it, it did bring me into the present and it it brought me to this feeling of like, what does a, the carceral landscape in Philadelphia look like then and now? There are all these places like the Door of Blessing, House of Good Shepherd, Magdalene Society, African-American Women's Home, all of these places that were sort of state projects or state adjacent projects that have totally disappeared and been torn down or repurposed in Philadelphia. So I think there's like something interesting there around recreating that kind of landscape for me. Um, and maybe there's like a digital map or something in my future. It's 
it's a little tricky because Eastern State is such a massive presence in Philly. And like, I worked in that building for like nine years and it was just sort of this normal experience for me. So there is some something of like a punishment landscape that is visible to a lot of Philadelphians, but then it's also like totally absent in, in other big ways. So yeah, I think just being at Slayton Farm and wandering around for like the three hours I was there, there's no one else there. It's completely abandoned, um, but you can access it if you hop over a little fence. Um, yeah, I was just thinking about Martha Falconer and what she would think. There's uh, the Martha Falconer Educational Center and someone, it says Martha Falconer and then someone spray painted was a bitch. Like, what would she think of the people who, you know, the sort of delinquent teens who probably broke into the site and spray painted that? And like, what are the, what what is her legacy exactly? And, you know, what do I have to say about her legacy? And what does it mean that, you know, the vice commission had very little impact on on Philly other than to like displace sex workers and um it was sort of harder on working class women that it was targeting um so I don't know there's something in there I'm trying to get at and I'm I'm not quite sure what it is that I want to say about it but there's I think there's something there yeah do we have another question Um, thank you all for sharing your work. And I guess I'm just curious, like to bring it back to what Ruth was kind of asking and like, how does your, how do you see your work overlapping since you are so disparate? Like if you all had to work on a project together, how would you synthesize? You know what I mean? Um, there's a lot of overlaps when you really think about it. And maybe as activist scholars, there's something you could bring together. I think something that came up for me is that um, when Erica was talking, you said your your project, some part of your project, or maybe a lot of your project is part of a colonial project. And I think that like these little local vice commissions that popped up in the sort of translocal phenomenon that they represented in the progressive era was part of a larger colonial project. And there were all these like foreign European and border outposts that these vice reformers would go to to sort of learn how to do vice suppression and learn how to control and surveil better. Um, so I think that it's, yeah, colonia, colonial, um, colonial projects is sort of popping up, I think, in a lot of our work. Um, and mine also is a colonial project, even though it looks sort of like a little local historic, history project. So I was thinking about uh, colonization and colonialism in this its residues. I'll just say something that I think speaks to um, kind of Aaron's point, which I love, but, um, uh, you know, as, as a white person doing this kind of work, um, as a white American um, doing this kind of work, uh, when working with a transnational team that has had to deal with a lot of the legacies of colonialism, much of these like human rights violations perpetuated by the US or the current like global order of things. Um, you know, I feel that it's important to kind of speak to my own community and to kind of dismantle a lot of the views that uh, white Americans have, you know, towards World War II history or to understand how uh, different policies that the US perpetuates creates issues elsewhere in the world um, because we are this global interconnected society um, and to offer an alternative and actually amplify alternatives that are, are out there kind of really trans, transformative um, kind of methodologies and approaches to peace. So I think that even if all of the peace research, researchers I work with, um, they're not all necessarily tackling uh, projects related to decolonization, um, but me as a person that's helping manage the project from my own background, I really have to kind of acknowledge all of these power dynamics and to find ways to um, navigate and overcome them um, to equitably kind of collaborate. So I think that would probably be the case if we were all to, um, you know, be working together in some capacity. Um, it requires a lot of work. Um, and 
I think it would be a project that we would uh, hopefully bring our own kind of backgrounds and, and skill sets and approaches. Um, so it'd be awesome to, to find a way to kind of work with you guys from our different you know, approaches that we bring to our work, which, um, you know, as, as Annie stated, has different threads through colonialism. What a fun, hard question. <laughs> um, so, like, my brain went two ways, the poet and the historian. Um, so, like, the poet in me is like, okay, so the three of us are going to try and travel. We're, we're going to go to that site and rescue the Native girls, and we're going to bring graffiti and use graffiti as a tool for peace. <laughs> Um, and so that's like, that's like, that's like my like fantasy brain. And then like my historian brain thinks, okay, so if the, we have these like native girls in the record that maybe other people haven't seen, um, then our part is to connect with uh, people connected to the residential school system and think about how they define peace within their work. So that way we're bringing justice to girls who were snatched from their homes and taken somewhere else. Um, because a lot of uh, Native work is looking into like the archives of claiming who you've lost um, and became a ghost without you knowing it. Is, is your mic on? No? No? Okay, now? All right, all right, sorry, I'll yell. Um, um, just building out what I'm hearing the three of you talk about too, is that I hear in all of your work in progress, um, a focus on land and landscapes. Um, so I think that that is something that unites you. Um, I think obviously, you know, the issue has come up around, you know, questions about colonialism. But the flip side of that is that I think you're each looking, and again, this came out in your responses to Kristen, is that you're each looking at examples of pushback against that and resistance. So I think one thing to think about would also be, you know, what does resistance look like in each of your projects? Who does it? What does resistance look like for the people you're studying? But also, what does resistance look like for you as scholars and you as scholar activists? Um, and then I think the final thing that I think really came out um, very beautifully in what you, the, the, your imaginings, Esperanza, is that, you know, for Annie, this is explicit, but I think for Esperanza and for you, Erica, too, it's, it's a little more implicit, but that I think issues of women and gender are really central to all three of these projects. And that last slide that you showed, Esperanza, showed that really, really clearly and connects to this question of, um, of resistance too. So those are, those are some of the themes that, that potentially, you know, these sort of, again, what happens when you, you put things together somewhat randomly, <laughs> um, but, you know, in really, really, right, and in really, really productive ways in the kinds of conversations that can ensue. I was just going to add one more to, to that list um, of the ways that the I see these projects overlapping. And um, what stood out to me, and maybe it's my own biases, um, is the role of journalistic representation in these projects. They, it seems like each engages in a different but overlapping way, both in terms of gender and sexuality, but um, in terms of how the how the problem is represented in journalism, which is again related to language and, and um, the questions that Mary was asking too. But um, for all of you, newspapers and um, public representation has a role to play in how these things are interpreted. Can you say that again? Yes. Um, I think I guess what I'm asking is, I, I framed it as a comment, but I do mean it as a question, which is how do you see journalistic representation influencing the how you come to discover what you learn about the subjects that you're engaging with?
Um, I guess, you know, there's always the tension between um, journalism within the archives, you know, kind of helping amplify stories that may have not been included in history books. Um, it's a like recovery process that I think, you know, Annie talks a lot about. Um, but at the same time, you know, there's journalism, which I think has falsely represented a lot of communities over time. And so that, you know, all of our projects probably push back against a lot of those narratives as well. Um, and it also gets like a larger view of, of history um, versus like journalism kind of try to capture particular moment, you know, as, as an event is unfolding. So um, I think representation in general is, is very important, um, but I guess often what I'm helping to work on is like recover untold stories or like lesser known narratives. Um, so I'd love to work in collaboration with journalists um, to kind of work on some of those stories and make sure that they get heard in the present moment as well. Um, I can try to answer your question, Hannah. I think that like in the journalistic account behind me on the screen, there's like a um, Martha Falconer is working to install more women police on police departments. So there's like a journalists sort of like naturalized this project of surveillance and they sort of consolidated and naturalized the need for more carceral state solutions in a way. So maybe this is like, a precursor to, you know, later 20th century incarceration projects. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm interested in recuperating the stories of, of predominantly, primarily women who were under these surveillance mechanisms, and it's really hard to find their voices. So all of the newspaper accounts are like, or the op-eds that I was finding in the Inquirer around the time of the Vice investigation are from like, you know, white male pastors and civic leaders. So there's, yeah, it's like, it, it just, the journalistic accounts are are very skewed towards a particular like sort of set or class of people. So um, I'm trying to find, like, I, I found a lot of names of women in the Philadelphia City Archives in the, like, court and case files. Um, so I have this great uh, breadth, but then the depth just isn't there unless the National Archives, which is um, archived and digitize all of these like Carlisle Indian files has the records of this young woman who was at Slayton Farm. And I think there were more of, of them, um, of her background at Slayton. So yeah, it's tricky. I it, their, Journalistic accounts are so useful and like so great and so much has been digitized. And then there's still that question for me about like recuperating the voices of women who were lost um, and who were surveilled and incarcerated and purportedly, you know, reformed by these projects or not reformed, um, and just finding their voices is really, really, really challenging. So that sort of shifted some of the questions around my project. I started being really interested in the people being surveilled, but now I'm finding all this, all these amazing paper trails for people like Martha Falconer. And so that's sort of, in a way, shifting some of the questions I'm asking and gotten me more interested in the reformers behind these projects. I'm going to quickly read a comment from Professor Lomas, um, Professor of English and American Studies, and then we'll go to Wit, who I think has a question, right? That's still correct? Okay, yeah. Um, so Professor Lomas says, um, so eloquent, I appreciated the way that these talks theorize their interventions. And I sought to think about the material and live realities of decolonization. I think of literary texts that might shed light on these questions. I'm this many years old, by the way. Um, Monique Mohe Mohica's play, uh, Princess and Pocahontas and the Blue Spots, discusses the implications of survival. Um, for Erica, do you engage with uh, Chicana X and Puerto Rican veteran oral histories? On Annie's work, have you thought about, oh boy, uh, Zitkela Saz, literary representations of life at White's Manual Institute um, and her other writings about Carlisle Institute. Um, I, salute, I salute each of you for this important research. Um, also, I understand that Native Americans have historically constituted the largest percentage uh, of the carceral populations in the United States, which I'm gonna mention as well. Um, so the connection to indigenous carceration um, yes, is a form of colonization. So there are a couple of questions buried in there as well. Um, so if people are willing to go into lunch for maybe a few minutes, we can answer them and we'll go to wit. Is that okay? People starting. Thank you, Thank you Professor Lomas. Uh, I could repeat it if you want. Um, so Erica, do you engage with Chicana X and Puerto Rican veteran oral histories? And for Annie, have you thought about 
um, Deep Kalasaz Literary Representations of Life at, quote, White Manual Institute. Thank you so much for the, the questions and, and great kind of resources and um, directions to think in. Um, I am aware that there is, I believe, a, a, a um, Latinx uh, oral history project. I'm not sure it might be in Texas. Is it the Volkses project? I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but um, I am aware of that archive. Um, we didn't collaborate with them directly through the National Homefront Project, mm -hmm. um, but I, I definitely would love to you know, make inroads with them. Um, and I think in, in what I've found, at least in some of my initial oral history work around World War II is that um, there are a lot of white folks that were uh, very willing to talk about their you know, experiences of service. And there are a lot of projects that have already captured some of those um, you know, memories. Um, but then trying to connect with other institutions and communities that are kind of doing um, you know, very diverse uh, veterans stories uh, was really essential. Um, so unfortunately, I didn't connect with that, that one project um, specifically through, through my time at Washington College, um, but I would love to in the future. And I definitely think that in my uh, preparing for my comprehensive exam, um, you know, thinking about uh, transnationalism, thinking about human rights, uh, border crossings, you know, Gloria Anzaldúa will be a, a huge, um, you know, uh, kind of contributor to my exam uh, reading list. So I'm, I'm looking forward to delving deeper into her work as well. And I, I'll get the name of the scholar in the book from you, Kyle. Oh, sure. Yeah, I wanted to share that with you. Um, but yeah, I, I'll just briefly, um, BIPOC and queer people are over incarcerated compared to their numbers in like the larger population. So I want to attend to those, you know, legacies and through lines. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I aim to do that. Cool. Should I go? Um, yeah. Hey, everybody. Uh, sorry, I'm shouting. I don't have any sense of volume modulation, but um, fantastic panel. I, I, I loved it. Um, one really quick thing, just because of the carceral landscape, um, Annie, that you've got up there. I, I don't know if people are aware of the old Essex County Jail, uh, but it's just like a 15 minute walk from here up New Street going west past NJIT. And it looks a little like that. It's a little fenced off, but um, just for folks who want to sort of take in the resonance of those, those landscapes, they're, they're so near to us here. Um, it's worth like a lunch break walk for anybody who has spare time. But the um, the question I wanted to ask everybody, and this this is not a weight that you uniquely bear. You you just happen to be the panel who's in front of us. But it's it's that big question about why scholar how scholarship matters, and you know the the issues that you're engaged with are so important, right? Whether it's peace and anti imperialism and stopping the U.S. war machine, decolonization as you know not just theory but practice, um, decriminalizing and and you know the liberation of sex workers and other people sort of scapegoated by the carceral state. And, and I wonder just how you'd like your scholarship to play into that, not just in an intellectual way, but I mean, how, how would you like to affect policy? You know, how, how would you like to make a material impact in, in those debates that goes beyond making an intellectual intervention unto itself? Um, and again, you know, you don't have to have the, um, obviously all of us here grapple with that and there's no magic solution. I'm just curious kind of how you think of that though and what, how you'd like to see your work reverberate in, in the material world of policy and statecraft and things like that. Thank you. I want to answer it, but I don't want to hold. But I don't want to hold the audience hostage. Um, so, are you hungry? <laughs> um, so, like, essentially, like, how do, you, how, what kind of impact would you like it to have beyond like this is my academic intervention, right? Um, I, I think for me, like, the the first thing is, like, I would like for scholars, both in history and environmental studies and within fire management to be like, the way we are doing prescribed burns does not matter if we do not take into account native communities and how they do it. And like for native communities to say like, fire is important to us and 
like we're we're not going to tolerate the way that these systems continue to like hold us hostage if like something starts to happen um because i think like within history like i find myself just like angry at a lot of people who write like it's just it it just feels like steeped in anti-indigenous sentiment of like this oh that's like poor this poor savage or something um and in a contemporary context what at least the in the conversations i have it's like here are the here are the colonial powers who say what to do and here are the native people doing it and it feels like it's like if if we're talking about decolonization that should be inverted and that shouldn't just be like something that the people of color or that the native people mumble on the side it should be like this is a study you should listen to us it needs to change I'll, I'll just briefly reflect. I think my kind of core um, motivation is to, you know, encourage the U.S. to see its history very differently um, and to see itself as a colonial power, um, and then to try to dismantle all those systems that have been put in place. Um, so I guess in general, uh, in terms of impact, you know, I would want a lot of the work that I do um, to help rewrite what constitutes as a human rights violation. Um, and to be able to see, you know, issues of uh, racial injustice, um, you know, gender oppression, everything else uh, related to these larger kind of international framings of, of human rights, um, and also to question those framings themselves too, because they, they are also kind of uh, complicated. They have complicated histories. So, um, yeah, I, I hope to be able to kind of have conversations within the human rights field and um, to just really help Americans kind of redefine um, how we how we view ourselves. Yeah, my answer is yes, I want to do that. Um, I used to say that mass incarceration had no historic precedent or international counterpart, which is true in the sense of like, we didn't used to lock up as many people as we, or we we, we didn't used to lock up as many people as we do today or as many citizens, um, sorry. There's, sorry, I'm having a, a brain moment. Um, I, I think that there is precedence here. I think the more I'm studying, there is precedence for, for this confluence of um, punishing folks who are, you know, racialized others and who are queer. And it's, there's all these sort of, it's the way that we punish and incarcerate people is sort of loaded with racism and sexism and transphobia and has been for the entirety of the American project. So um, I think there is precedence here and, you know, ultimately, I'd, I'd like to make some kind of dent in like undoing the carceral state or undoing carcerality. And that's sort of a, a broad goal of mine in some way, but I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to do that. Thanks, everyone. Um, so we requested to go to lunch through the far door and come back around through the food is outside in the hallway and then come back in this way.
I, I was looking for you and I didn't realize you bent down. I was like, where'd he go? Uh, All right, everybody, welcome back. Good afternoon. Welcome back. <laughs> you know teacher voice. That's why you're like, hmm, wait, what? Yeah, one, two, three, eyes on me. OK. Uh, all right, everyone. I hope everyone got something to eat, got to socialize. That's sort of the best part of the day in some ways. Um, I'm extremely excited to introduce our keynote speaker today, Associate Professor of History at Johns Hopkins University and of course a graduate of our PhD program in 2015, Dr. Jules Gill-Peterson. Uh, Dr. Gill-Peterson, uh, as I said, is a graduate of our PhD program and author of Histories of the Transgender Child, published in 2018 with the University of Minnesota Press, winner of a Lambda Literary Award, Children's Literature Association Book Award, and named one of the best transgender literature by Susan Stryker. In addition, Dr. Gail Peterson contributes her expertise to numerous media outlets, including CNN and New York Times, as well as via a regular Substack newsletter that you should subscribe to called Sad Brown Girl. She's currently working on a number of new important projects. The Trans Girl Lyric, an unconventional memoir that defiantly says no to how our culture treats trans women of color. A Trans Woman Manifesto, a short accessible book for activists and scholars on the devaluation of trans women by both anti-trans and generic pro-trans politics and gender underground, a history of trans DIY. <clears throat> a, book that, a book that reframes the trans 20th century, not through institutional medicine, but the myriad do-it-yourself practices of trans people that forge parallel medical and social worlds of transition. So I don't think it's difficult to see how this important and necessary work is part of scholarship that matters and part of the legacy of our program. So please welcome, please join me in welcoming our keynote speaker, Dr. Jules Gill Peterson. Thank you so much. Um, so nice to be here. I, I just like my heart is very full. Um, and I, you know, I said uh, earlier, you know, when I, I popped off the train at Penn Station earlier, I just had like total muscle memory moment. Like I know where I'm going. Well. Except in the sense that I'd never been in this building before, <laughs> but it is really, really wonderful to be back here. Apparently, the first time that I have been back, I think, um, you know, other than driving by or taking the train going right by, and I've certainly always, you know, leered out the window in love at, at work. Um, so it's really exciting to be here. There's so much I could say and, and would like to say about um, how meaningful it is, you know, to, yeah, to be able to return to the place. Uh, that you got your PhD, but also the sort of formative intellectual community, you know, that that launches one's career. And it's, you know, not something I would have necessarily even dreamed of, of being able to do, um, you know, while I was here. And so, you know, for so many reasons, it's it's really quite uh, a lucky pleasure. And I, and, and I feel very grateful. Um, I'm, I'm going to share with you a talk today that comes from one of the apparently three million things I'm working on right now. Um, uh, uh, and, you know, so this is sort of fresh work um, and I wa really want to kind of dial into it to give us something to think through. And so, you know, I hope I hope the ways in which it sort of plugs into to the theme of today um, emerge over the course of the talk. Um, but I'm also happy to kind of, you know, get, get into it with you afterwards. And it is also a bit of a, a, a in part, a New York City area kind of history so hopefully it rhymes well with um, a lot of the other work today. So this is how to do the trans history of sexuality. The most common question that I'm asked 
actually whenever I present my work, whether it's in an academic or a public venue, is really a variation on the following. Why are there so many trans women in history and so few trans men? When I was first presenting the research that formed the heart of, of my book, Histories of the Transgender Child, I was actually really quite puzzled by frequent questions asking whether I had ever encountered any trans boys in the archive or if it had been only trans girls who were seen by doctors for most of the 20th century. And prone as I am sometimes to intellectual overreaction, I ended up writing the final chapter of the book to focus specifically on trans boyhood, thinking that, you know, that would once and for all satisfy such questions. Although there were differences in how institutional medicine treated trans girls and boys, and I certainly hope to account for those differences in my book, I just never thought that boys would be absent from a trans history of childhood. But when the peer reviews of the manuscript came in and one reviewer asked why I was writing about trans girls and boys at all, as if I were missing the much more obvious mandate of transgender to challenge the gender binary as such, I had to revisit the issue. Uh, the children I was writing about described themselves unambiguously as boys and girls to override their declarations of self in the service of a queer theory of subverting the binary would have been from my perspective as an historian interested in a critical fidelity to the limits of the available record tantamount to malpractice. But this gender trouble in trans history and in trans studies more broadly has remained on my mind. How could it not? For at times it has generated real heat, a kind of battle of the trans sexes composed of various accusations that trans women don't know how to write about trans men without acting out a certain inappropriate gender aggression and vice versa. Now, I understand the fault line here to broadly reflect two dynamics. First, it's catalyzed by present day political imaginaries around identity in the US. So although the mechanics of trans misogyny and particularly the hypervisibility of black and brown trans women continue to negatively frame certain types uh, as certain types of trans women as the paradigmatic images of transness, trans men and transmasculine non-binary people are nonetheless enjoying significant cultural and political presence that really is sort of novel, producing a lot of friction in an environment structured by real scarcity. As the celebrated posthumous publication of Lou Sullivan's diaries in 2019 perhaps reflects the hunger for specific transmasculine lineages is only just beginning to be met. And if Lou's 1980 fight to live and more specifically die as a gay trans man is any indicator, the chronology of transmasculinity is still widely understood to be recent and actually imperiled if we consider you know, one of the anti-trans moral panics du jour which is the one that fabulates that trans masculinity is a sort of 21st century social contagion. But the second reason, you know, I think this is still such a live wire is that the history of medicine model that formed the initial historiography of transgender life reiterated the disproportionate interest of doctors, psychiatrists, and researchers themselves in trans femininity. So the paradigmatic transsexual of the mid 20th century was not incidentally a woman nor a white woman at that. The transsexual was conceptually a woman first, something detectable in the conspicuous attempts of so many clinicians to adapt their models to trans men. In one of the most telling examples, psychiatrist and psychoanalyst Robert Stoller at the University of California, Los Angeles, wagered his whole theory of transsexual ideology on the, and you're never gonna guess this, idea of too much mother, yeah, we've heard that one before. The idea that a foundational closeness between a mother and her male child leads to the latter's primary identification with femininity from infancy. And as a result, in a chapter on transmasculinity in his 1976 book, The Transsexual Experiment, uh, Stoller leaves himself the awkward task of inverting the gender of his own diagnostic theory. Or if you'll pardon the pun, he had to figure out how to transition it. So Stoller was not unfamiliar with trans men. He had some among his you know, closest patients. It's just that he conceptually subordinated them to trans women. Now, my suspicion 
overall is that this contest over the shared custody of the umbrella category transgender and its predecessors depends mostly on a poor reading of history of a misattributed shared genealogy between different trans people. And I would call this tendency of misattribution adapting some of the provocations of Christopher Chitty's posthumous work, Sexual Hegemony, the sort of problem of a nominalist transgender history. So in a nominalist account, we effectively continue to package up a contemporary Western notion of transgender subjectivity, you know, as an interior identity, and then continually discover it in the past, <laughs> despite our profession of not wanting to do that most of all. The problem of historical interpretation becomes strangely about whether or not we can declare people in the past to be transgender, which is to say then like us, rather than investigating the conditions of possibility for people's trans lives in the past, which is to say in their present. This occurs even when scholars insist that the would-be trans people of the past are not like us, but then choose often to label them transgender anyways without explaining what the difference is, which I would say makes them appear arguably more opaque than they would have without a transgender description. And so this is a tendency I see in lots of places, but you know, perhaps most in the scholarship that says it is looking for those in the past who transed their gender, as in utilize trans as a verb instead of a prefix. And I'm not sure that actually <laughs> explains anything in particular, because transgender history becomes primarily about us who we are looking at the past and our desires for continuity or alterity. What is never explained is why groups of people came to be seen during their lifetimes as something also interpretable after the fact as trans or perhaps interpretable through their own schemas. What social forces, structures or problems gave rise to the presence or absence of these people in available archives? What are the structural conditions of possibility for transgender subjects in the past, rather than by the standards of our own present moment? As if we could ever agree on those. I think answering these questions requires, however polemically, abandoning all attachments to a transgender subject, which, you know, should, should be easy, but, but maybe isn't. Uh, you know, there's no such unified subject to call upon, just as there's no such unified subject in the world today. And to return to this gender trouble I've been meditating on, I think the actual reason why trans women and trans men aren't equally visible in the past is simply that they don't have a shared history. The umbrella model of transgender came about in the 1990s. Why would we think it applies universally across time and space? As recent work on transmasculine history, particularly Emily Skidmore's wonderful book, True Sex, has begun to show many white trans men in the US and England have lived pretty normal, quiet lives for the past two centuries. They didn't flock to large cities and live in the gay underworld where we find most trans women or even working class butch femme subcultures. They were more likely to leave cities for small towns, marry women and take up traditional men's labor. The locally regulated familiar normativity of small towns, as Skidmore argues, was just really amenable to the project of living as a white man in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. We might say the bar was, you know, a little lower for living as a white man than it was for living as any kind of woman. So to let go of both the nominalist and the gender umbrella impulses, all of that is to say I want to propose today that we think instead of transgender history as having a rich home in the methodology of the history of sexuality, coincidentally, the field I was trained in here in American studies. And that a transgender history of sexuality grants us the means to historicize the intramural gender differences that are causing so much friction today, among many other intramural differences. And so while work on the history of trans men is actually growing, I should say there is today precisely no scholarship historicizing trans femininity. And in the space of that total vacuum, I'm going to offer several hypotheses from one of the works in progress that Kyle mentioned, which has a new title. So now it's called A Short History of Trans Misogyny. Um, so in this, in this project, I take it as axiomatic that there's no uni unified category of trans woman or trans femininity with, you know, to which I could appeal, much like there's no unified category of woman 
frame. But one card concrete starting place for this investigation is gender labor, the persistent association of trans women with criminalized sex work in particular. This association has often stood in for working class and vernacular trans feminine history, as opposed to the more bourgeois stratum of the history of sexology and the later sort of history of transsexual medicine. But rather than assuming as an enduring truth that for trans women, sex work is the only job they can get to manage the status and property loss that attends giving up being treated as a man as if that were true in all times and places, I wanna try to date, if only in broad strokes at first, some of the specific times and places in which trans feminine sex workers are lit up by a system of power worthy of that term trans feminine uh, <laughs> in a historically patterned sense. And I say this, you know, not just because like, you know, I'm just explaining what history is, but because there's enticing evidence of trans feminine sex work that just stretches back too far for the imagination. So take one kind of infamous case, Eleanor Reichner, who was arrested on sodomy charges in London in 1394. What's challenging about interpreting Reichner's life has hardly to do with whether or not she was really a trans woman in the way that we use that phrase today. Like we wouldn't you know, dare, I don't think, make that kind of conflation. Rather, I would like to know what constitute the key differences between how and why she was apprehended by the police as a sex worker in early modern London and much more recent trans feminine sex workers continue to be arrested in major global cities. It is the incredibly long durée of over six centuries of trans feminine sex workers being arrested that forms the historical object of inquiry, not a shared gender across time. And so what extant historiography there is on the emergence of a so-called modern trans femininity really does come in familiar form to the history of homosexuality and queer studies. The sort of fin de siècle sexological scene where the concept of inversion held together as one forms we've only recently begun to strenuously separate in bourgeois Western cultures into two. That is to say transness as a kind of cross-gendered or gendered state and gayness as sexual object choice. But this era, one in which the line between a trans woman and an effeminate gay man appeared less certain, is clearly an important place to return. And one of the signature contributions of George Chauncey's Gay New York, to which transgender studies scholars, I think, have paid scandalously inadequate attention, is that the working class gay underworld of the period contained a complex range of fairies, which is the titular figure of the book, that included some people we might now reasonably interpret as trans feminine, but only some. Here I'm adopting a different reading practice than my, my darling colleague and friend Emma Heaney in her book, The New Woman, where she argues that fairies were simply socially equivalent to women which I find to be a bit of an overreading of Chauncey's research. By far, most of the painted youths and red tie wearing fairies that gay New York documents were part of a culturally legible disidentification with American masculinity. One evidenced in the fact that normal men would not suffer any particular loss of status for having sex with them, provided they had sex with them in the right way. But there are also rarer figures in the archive fairies who dressed and lived as women in ways that seemingly distinguished them from the norm, even among the abnormal, so to speak. One of my all-time faves is named Loop the Loop, who took her name from the Coney Island amusement park itself, who was actually married to a man. She did sex work around Prospect Park in Brooklyn, and as we learned from Chauncey, she and her fellow girls paid off the cops to protect themselves. In that way, they were very typical for women sex workers in New York City in the era, where the sex economy was actually quite deeply integrated into the city's notoriously corrupt institutions, the municipal police department among them. Or actually, I actually think it was already the NYPD by then. But anyways, um, but was Loop the Loop just like any other woman? No. For one thing, to be just like any other sex worker was hardly to be like a generic woman considering that prostitutes were regarded as among the lowest of women in New York. But more importantly, Loop the Loop explained in an interview with a doctor in 1906, 
that her clients couldn't possibly mistake her for a regular woman. She was actually kind of preoccupied with these sorts of obvious tells. So she talks to the doctor about, for example, the hair on her legs. Though she also contends in this interview that, quote, most of the boys don't mind at all. That's my imagination of her voice. Okay. Chauncey thus concludes that Loop the Loop's, quote, efforts at female impersonation would not have persuaded any of his clients that they were having sex with a woman. And to me, that seems broadly right, but there is an additional possibility for reading this disclosure hiding in plain sight. Loop the Loop may have been explaining, however, obliquely either to the doctor in 1906 or to George Chauncey or to our contemporary eyes that she was desirable to men precisely because they would not have mistaken her for any other woman, nor for a more conventional fairy, that is to say, an effeminate man or third sexer. Men may have sought her out as a sex worker and paid her because she was trans feminine. So on what grounds could we evaluate that interpretive possibility? One of Loop the Loop's contemporaries, Jenny June, makes the claim outright. So thank you, Jenny. Uh, in her second memoir, The Female Impersonators, June narrates the summer of 1895, she spent socializing with young men in Stuyvesant Square in Manhattan, which was a very well-known vice district. And so while recalling that the men, quote, like to flirt with me an hour in the park as if I were a full-fledged mademoiselle, she stresses that they did not mistake her for a normal woman. Rather, disclosure of her status concerned the management of the danger of already being perceived as different. So when she discloses to one young man that she is a, quote, androgen, that's her word for it, she adds for the reader's sake that, quote, from my dress and mannerisms, any city-bred youth would have already judged my sexual status. So according to her, New York is already full of chasers in 1895. And so this particular man tells June, yeah, he already knew, quote, but had feared saying something offensive. Good boy. Uh, if he already knew, though, and he wouldn't have thought himself deceived to be going on a date with her, then why exactly did June have to be careful and, as she puts it in the memoir, quote, ascertain his trustworthiness through a long series of questions? Well, it was because, apparently, of the threat of violence attached to the desire structuring their social interaction. I was always ultra wary about falling into a trap, June writes. Androgenes are murdered every few months in New York merely because of intense hatred of effeminacy instilled by education in the breasts of fully fledged males. The clue, in other words, to establishing the recognizability of some fairies as specifically trans feminine is that they were illuminated simultaneously by a knowing regard of male desire that differentiated them from other kinds of fairies and an accompanying threat of feminizing violence to secure social difference. That such sex workers were already being attacked or murdered in this era in New York City in terms oddly nearly identical to how poor trans women's exceptional exposure to intimate violence from men today is narrated is precisely what gives me pause here. June seems to be narrating a pretty conventional, even contemporary definition of trans misogyny. But June is not a super ideal source particularly because she was honestly slumming it amongst the city's fairies, being herself wealthy. She was as much a bourgeois observer as a participant in this working class culture. In other words, she did not rely on sex work to make ends meet. But if one historical hypothesis is that something recognizable that we might call trans misogyny is afflicting trans feminine sex workers by the end of the 19th century, one way to corroborate that point would now be to work backwards and look at an earlier period when such trans feminine people were not yet subject to this particular pattern of knowing visibility and violence from men. So dating the historical advent of this form of power would help us understand trans femininity within the history of sexuality that includes fairies, right? Gay people, sex workers, women writ large. And so for that reason, however, backwards it is of me to do so, I want to go backwards <laughs> uh, now, go backwards from Jenny June's fin de siècle moment to the antebellum period in New York City. And I want to contrast her with another now pretty famous trans sex worker you may have heard of, Mary Jones. 
Jones was first arrested in 1836 and her life became a spectacle in the city's sporting press for several decades, becoming the punchline of several satirical tropes about the underworld and its close proximity to antebellum high society. Once again, someone who appears to be a trans woman does sex work and is arrested. Yet as we shall see, it's not as clear that Jones was apprehended by the same procedure of power that June describes, right? Or that drove Loop the Loop's business and need to pay off the cops. But interpreting Jones's life is exceptionally difficult because of the archival record, the historical context of her arrests and the existing historiography has tried to make her an example of several competing nominalist projects. So let me try and work through it with you to get us to a conclusion. So here's what I can say, I think. In the summer of 1836, New York City was, well, you know, tense. Violent, violent riots had been raging for years, uh, you know, uh, mostly over the possibility of abolishing slavery nationwide. And one June evening, a white man named Robert Haslam was out walking lower Manhattan streets, well known for hosting a lively public sex industry. On Bleecker Street, he ran into a well-dressed black woman named Mary Jones. Where are you going, pretty maid? He allegedly asked her and she invited him to follow her back to her home. After arriving in an alley on Green Street, they may have had sex, depending on whether or not we believe the press. And as Haslam was walking home later, he found that his wallet was missing from his clothes. But he also apparently found a wallet belonging to someone else. And somehow he managed to track down the man to whom that other wallet belonged. Okay. The next morning, the two men held a police officer named Bowyer and explained the situation. Now, I should say such thefts of men's wallet by, wallets by sex workers was very common in this era, and it was not at all unusual for men to pursue charges against sex workers, civil charges to recover their money in the New York court system. That was actually quite commonplace. So these three men, one of them being a cop, resolved to entrap Jones. Later that night, Bowyer went down to the Bowery and sought her out. He propositioned Jones as Haslam had, and she invited him back to the Green Street brothel where she lived. Inside, he may have refused to pay for sex, but in any case, he then had her lead him into the alley where Haslam had gone the night before. There, Jones apparently offered sex again, and according to the press, a tussle ensued during which, and you're never going to believe this, literally, several wallets apparently fell out of her bosom, including Robert Haslam's. Jones was arrested by Bowyer. He searched her home and found more wallets, and then he searched her person, at which point he discovered her ostensibly male genitals. Six days later, Mary Jones was put on trial for grand larceny in the Court of General Sessions. She pled not guilty. Jones was tried in her women's clothing and wig, no doubt in an attempt to humiliate her, which was how it was covered in the press. But the trial transcript also records a version of her testimony in which she explains that she was born free in New York City, had at one point in her life served in the military, and was presently 33 years old. When she was asked, what induced you to dress yourself in women's clothes? This is how her reply was recorded. I have been in the practice of waiting upon girls of ill fame and made up their beds and received the company at the door and received the money for rooms, etc. And they induced me to dress in women's clothes, saying I looked so much better in them. And I have always attended parties among, my, among the people of my own color dressed this way. And in New Orleans, I always dressed this way. Jones was sentenced to prison upstate and a lithograph print of her produced around this time labeled her, as you can see, the man monster. But you'll also notice depict her, it depicts her as a pretty well-dressed woman. Jones became a recurring press item for over a decade with her subsequent arrests, mostly on vagrancy charges, making her something of an idiom in New York. She was also given the degrading nickname Beefsteak Pete a moniker originated in the Sun's coverage of the 1836 trial, but which was repeated in numerous articles in the years that followed. 
The contention was that she used some sort of leather device to simulate female genitals in her work. The Sun actually printed its explanation, the origin of this story in Latin, as you know, all self-respecting papers would, which translates very awkwardly indeed as saying, quote, that Jones had, quote, been fitted with a piece of cow, pierced and opened like a woman's womb, held up with a girdle. So that man clearly knew a lot about women's bodies. Uh, but because of the decades long press coverage and the lithograph, Jones has actually long been extremely visible in the archive of Antebellum New York City, very well known. But the historiography on her life has been almost as shallow as the sporting press coverage at the time. So, you know, Jones appears, for example, in Timothy Guilfoyle's classic and wonderful monograph on the history of sex work in New York City, City of Eros, without too much interpretation, beyond suggesting that she is evidence of the, quote, toleration of homosexuality, end quote, in the city at the time. And, you know, Guilfoyle's citation there is actually like Chauncey's dissertation, so I don't make too much of it. Um, it's, it's, it's Jonathan Ned Katz who authored the most insistent reading of Jones as a gay man without any justification that I can surmise, using her legal name and masculine pronouns and writing that, quote, the story of Suwali's arrest shows us an African-American man working the race, class, sexuality, and gender systems to appropriate for himself a little of the wealth of white men. In these documents, the exact character of Suwali's erotic desire remains ambiguous, though his pecuniary motive is clear, a man appropriating for his own a particular model of illicit womanhood. This notion of appropriation makes Jones rather crudely, I think, into a gay man who apparently only pretended to be a woman for some completely unstated sexual and monetary gratification. In short, Katz comes perilously close to repeating the form of scandal attributed to Jones in the sporting press, not to mention the misogynist trope of trans femininity as deception. Perhaps in the phallic economy of desire animating some gay men's historical projects, it was impossible to see a black woman, let alone a black trans woman, as a sexual, a sexual subject except through the trope of deceit. In any case, reclamations of Jones, more recent ones that aim to undo this misinterpretation by insisting on her self-evident trans womanhood have not particularly contributed to our understanding of why she was a sensation in the antebellum era, insisting instead on her just sort of generic transness and often using language like her being an ancestor, which I don't find very explanatory. It is instead Black studies scholars who have asked much better questions, breaking from the nominalist impulse. C. Riley Snorton, drawing on the conceptual framework of the ungendering of Black womanhood from Hortense Spillers, situates Joan's lithographic portrait in relation to the genre's most common usage in the 1830s, runaway slave ads. In this frame, Jones is cast within the broader history of Black gender in the US, the way that, uh, as Snorton puts it, quote, the ungendering of blackness is also the context for imagining gender as subject to rearrangement. I, I find his gloss quite clarifying, though it is sort of by design speculative rather than historical. So uh, Snorton writes, although it is not possible to declare definitively and with all the force of the historical record, whether Jones's attire of women's clothes was a matter of personal definition, a kind of trans self-fashioning, it is clear that the practice of cross-dressing, a process without a stable gender referent, created an imaginative context for Jones and her Johns, as the ungendering of Blackness created a space for emergence within dynamics of political, economic, and cultural modes of exchange. The praxis of emergence was most frequently criminalized, such that, as Jones's narrative bears out, theft described the manner with which free Blacks were seen as being in illicit possession of themselves. So while Snorton's reading is, you know, kind of zoomed out, right, sort of to a macro theoretical level, reading Jones through the conceptual import of slavery's ungendering, Tavanyongo offers a more local reading in New York City in the Amalgamation Waltz. 
Jones was in Nyong'o's reading a specific kind of satirical figure in a moment in which the project of abolition was libeled sexually by the white public. New York City's reputation as a city in which high society shared the streets with prostitutes and miscegenationists had become a central metaphor for the moral dangers of abolition, such that the satire accomplished through Mary Jones has to do with precisely how unremarkable a woman she looked in her lithograph, if you'll recall. As Nyong'o puts it, quote, the caricature here cuts both ways, certainly against Sawali, that is Mary Jones, but also against well-to-do ladies and gentlemen attempting French pretensions along Broadway. The New York press was, quote, casting impolite doubts as to whether or not Mr. Robert Haslam was in fact deceived as to Suwali's gender, or whether indeed gender had not become stylized beyond recognition within the flux of urban life. What was spectacular about Mary Jones was hardly that she was a different species of woman, but rather that her blackness facilitated a punchline that the respectable white men and women of New York might be in some way like her due to their proximity in a sexual economy. For Nyong'o, the key phrase in the reportage on her arrest and trial then was not about her cross-dressing, but rather the quote, practical, practical amalgamation of her associated with her sex work. As he explains, quote, the modifier practical redoubles the satire insofar as it indexes the standard anti-abolitionist charge that equality in theory meant amalgamation in practice. Suwali's activities were thus obliquely produced as evidence against the claims of abolitionists as indexing the social chaos that would accompany the overthrow of slavery and racial domination, end quote. So I find Snorton and Nyong'o's readings really compelling in that they attend to the anti-Black matrix in which Jones's gender and sexuality were certainly significant, but not historically deterministic in any sense. They were narrative features of white anxiety and satire. So rather than trying to place Mary Jones in a nominalist history of trans women as a kind of separate social group, we see that any history of trans femininity must contend with the impact of the historical arrangements of black gender writ large or black ungender as well. But as Nyong'o points out, this makes Jones an exceptionally difficult person to return to. One who has frankly often been left out of the historiography of black antebellum life, perhaps for the reservoir of shame attached to her figure, that is Nyong'o's speculation. Her excessive visibility, as Nyong'o puts it, quote, has ironically helped ensure uh, her invisibility to a posterity that has considered her too strange to be true. It's this idea that trans feminine life in the past, particularly where it, uh, in the context of black women and sex workers is in some way too strange to be true. That is truly a formidable problem for any scholar. And so perhaps the only ones willing to break this cycle of shame have been unsurprisingly black trans women. In Silesia, a film now held in the permanent collection at, the, at MoMA, the artist Tourmaline sets aside the entire problem of the archive in a project of black speculation. So Silesia places Mary Jones, not downtown, but in Seneca Village, a vibrant antebellum black community in Manhattan where free black residents owned property briefly until Central Park was constructed. Um, but by placing Jones in a property owning black community, the film overturns the intractable libel that Snorton identified whereby antebellum black subjects in general were seen as being in illicit possession of their own selves. And then in journalist and activist Raquel Willis's Black History Month video series this past February, she began with telling Jones's story. Both Tourmaline and Willis are unashamed to embrace Jones, but in, so, in doing so, they, they really differ, I think, from the nominalist invocations of Jones as either a gay man or a trans woman. Willis, for example, claims Jones not just as an entry in Black trans history in a minor key, but as, quote, this through line of how Black women in general have been demonized throughout US history. So I really see Tourmaline and Willis as engaging in a critical project of reclamation, 
reclaiming Jones into a history of Black responses to the violence of ungendering, which is a frame that entirely exceeds a binary of interpretations between trans and non-trans, right? Hmm. I was supposed to have two more pages. Let me, I mean, I know I have them. <laughs> um, that's weird, I wonder where they went. Okay, well, that's fine. I have them on the computer. I'll make it work. Yeah, actually that works well. because There's only one slide left. So hold the slide in your mind because <laughs> I'm about to take it away. So with this intervention in mind, kind of having reviewed the historiography of it all, I want to return to the question with which I opened this investigation. Was Jones apprehended by a form of transmisogyny in the antebellum era? Hmm. I guess I didn't have my talk open. Just give me one second here. Da -da -da -da. I have no idea where those two pages went. It's very odd. Okay, here we go. So was Mary Jones subject to a similar illumination and aggression by a form of male desire attached to a latent threat of sexualizing violence? In some ways, the question unfortunately turns on the shameful problem of euphemism. I can say more about this, but I broadly distrust that Jones ever employed that beefsteak contraption. It seems equally likely to me that the antebellum press invented the thing as part of its social satire. Um, let me just find my spot here. Okay, great. But even if, or especially if beefsteak Pete is an invention of the white imagination, that invention works as evidence that Mary Jones was not apprehended in the same way as Jenny June, Loop the Loop, or the late 19th century trans femmes. The beefsteak parable is meant to suggest that Jones successfully tricked men like Robert Haslam, who sought her out and interacted with her as if she were any other black woman in public or a sex worker. Her gender transition or transgression is only found out after the fact, suggesting that the beefsteak might be a retrospective narrative device dev devised to soothe anxious and titillated white readers. Recall that Jones was not arrested for sodomy, not arrested for prostitution, but for grand larceny, stealing wallets. Jones was then made a spectacle because of a social and sexual satire of abolition as a project that would result in what the press termed practical amalgamation. In the framing of this satire, Jones's gender transgression was added narrative value, not the primary frame. She was not made a spectacle because she was trans. It seems far more likely that she was viewed as a priori improperly gendered because she was free, black, and circulating in a public economy, and one of sex that had become a central metaphor levied against the abolition of slavery. The idea that she was able to successfully trick the men she had sex with, or that they interacted with her transactionally as a black woman, the subjects of the satire, are what lead me to this interpretation. And the meaning of her culturally located trans femininity in the antebellum black cultures of New York and New Orleans as her declaration in court testifies remain interestingly to me, actually beyond the reach of historical knowledge as such, much as it was beyond the reach of the white men who prosecuted and caricaturized her. Her declaration of the self-evidence of her womanhood, one that actually really, I do think there is a lineage of black trans women declaring the self-evidence of their women and of Black women more broadly, right? Um, it really testifies to the opacity of her gender, you know, or maybe what Kevin Quashie terms the sovereignty of her Black interiority, what escaped the clutches of the law and the sporting press by being reserved, though carefully named. So recall, you know, Jones refers to dressing this way in New Orleans, as far as I could tell, she had no legal incentive to say that. <laughs> um, you know, she wasn't on trial for cross-dressing. So I take that declaration to mean something in a register different from the rest of her utterances at trial. 
Jones may have been a public woman, as sex workers were colloquially termed in the era, but she was not rendered hypervisible by the matrix of desire and violence that characterizes modern trans misogyny, clearly by the end of the 19th century. So that was a long investigation, but you know, this is sort of the larger hypothesis of the book length project in which I'm writing about Jones, that there's a specific history and composition to trans misogyny that is in formation over the course of the 19th century, and not just in the United States. I'm happy to talk about a broader global history here, but that trans misogyny reshapes a racial and criminalized economy public space and sex work in late, late 19th century cities by beginning to sexualize trans femininity within a male-centric economy of desire and compensatory gendered violence, the kind June writes about when she describes going on dates with a young man who knew her status and then violently robbed her, leaving her for dead. This pattern of desire and violence is coincident in the era in urban sex economies around the world, as I said, from New York to London, but also in colonial India, the Philippines and Hawaii, some of the other sites I'm writing about. The advent of modern trans misogyny, in other words, comes in the logic of trans panic a mode that distinguishes through desiring that the trans woman is different from other women, but pairs that desire with preemptive violence that can then be justified after the fact, as in the literal trans panic defense still admissible in court in many jurisdictions today, and also introduced via the United States into other parts of the world. To desire the trans woman in this sense is always accompanied by a threat of disavowing violence, a violence meant to cleanse the male subject of his contamination by her difference, which is different from how non-trans women are subject to misogynist violence, though not unrelated. In this sense, trans misogyny shares an important historical overlap with violence against women more broadly, but also with homophobic violence and the gay panic first, uh, gay panic defense first directed, uh, excuse me, the gay panic directed also at fairies and other effeminate subjects in the late 19th century. If trans misogyny is distinct and not trans historical, it does not yet seem to me to be in play for Mary Jones, but by the, by the time Jenny June is writing, it would seem to be a fixture of New York street life. So to wrap up, there are a number of reasons why I find this history of sexuality approach helpful, namely, it's just like better scholarship, right? It yields a greater insight into how trans femininity's conditions of possibility shift over time and with geography. And considering how pervasive and devastating the logic of trans panic and trans misogyny continue to prove to be for trans women today, I simply think we need a rigorous account of what defines the specific mode of desire and violence and where it is formed historically. And then, you know, perhaps most excitingly or nerdy, nerdily to me, I find it both humbling and thrilling to meet the sheer alterity of trans femininity in the past and asked after it humbly for its pedagogy. The history of trans women and trans femininity is not for me a search for origin or continuity or ancestry. It is rather a testament to the sheer range of invention and genius it takes to find a trans feminine way trans feminine way of life that is in this world. Thanks so much. All right, so we'll open up for questions, thoughts. Nothing exciting to show you there other than, well, it will eventually say, I think, thank you. There you go. <laughs> Dr. Ruth. I couldn't possibly say myself. I had to write it out on the slide. Okay. Uh, that was just a, a fantastic, really uh, brilliant, interesting talk. Thank you so much. Um, I was wondering if you could uh, maybe say a little bit more about geography. Um, you know, certainly in your talk, you mentioned uh, a, a number of different geographic spaces within New York and New Orleans, but I was really struck by uh, June's invocation of the city bred youth would immediately know her status, which is interesting, right? Because then it sort of contrasts with non city bred people. So there's some urban, rural kind of conceptualization going on there. Um, so I was just wondering if you could just speak 
more to geography and how that plays into the work that you're doing? Yeah, it's a fabulous question um, and a great place to to start elaborating, right? You know, I'm, I'm interested in, in, in a sort of non-redemptive sense in trans femininity as a kind of marker of modernity, of capitalist colonial modernity. You know, which is to say it's not, you know, trans femininity not as an inborn ontological trait that links people around the world, which is just another dream of Western subjectivity expanded outward, but rather the product, contradictory product of, among other things, um, you know, what what Christopher Chitty or Sylvia Federici, you know, have, have taken up as, you know, the process of primitive accumulation through which capitalism establishes it's sort of geography, right? Which is to say the production of proletarianized populations en masse that then are driven into cities, right? And become then the central targets of regimes of moral uh, policing that often are about male sexuality in public and you know, keeping women out of public, right? And there's a way that then actually the history of trans femininity fits within that, right? Because we could think about it in two ways, right? The idea of the city bred youth, right? It's the actual desire for trans femininity is a product of cities and in this particular form of it, right? And I think about this as also offering again, this kind of um, global history of cities, right? And so we can think about so many different colonized and indigenous groups, many of whom had entirely different systems for things that we call, we in the United States or in the West or increasingly in NGOs call gender or transgender, right? But actually that there is a problem that forms when colonialism you know, shows up to town and primitive accumulation is running wild, which is to say that people who previously may have lived lives that we might, you know, I think it's actually just inappropriate to call them trans, but for the sake of, you know, exposition, you know, trans feminine lives no longer can occupy them in the socially sanctioned roles in which they existed. There are many, many different kinds, spiritual, labor-based, political, all over the world in almost every culture, and instead find themselves in this very Western capitalist problem of, well, I'm being <laughs> violently misgendered as male, but I don't want to live as a man. And so since I can't get married, I have no other choice but to do sex work in vice districts. And so that's partially sort of the, the, the kind of punch that I'm following in my work. So sort of following where, um, yeah, colonial um, administrative and military, you know, um, encampments crop up, build out cities around the world, right? And there, those cities always come with vice districts and they're always suddenly at a certain moment are trans feminine sex workers who are, you know, a new object of desire and violence that sort of thematize the kind of arrival of an urban capitalist geography, an incredibly uneven one, right? And so to me, it's really interesting to then link that and look at the coincidence temporally in order to think about how do we link lower Manhattan, you know, parts of New Orleans to, um, you know, colonial Bombay, right, or to Honolulu or Waikiki, um, or to, you know, um, yeah, to parts of the Philippines around uh, naval bases or something like that, right? So I think there's something, you know, right, I love this because it's about the problem of scale, right? And so the city is a great anchor, um, but in part because cities are so local, they let you get down on the street, right, where these people are, where they are living and working and where things are happening, but they let you also scale up and understand the city as a form produced in a certain time and place uh, in global history. So at least such is the, the supposition at the moment. So I'm kind of interested in that scalar problem that I think cities, you know, so many of us are drawn to thinking through cities for that same reason. So yeah, just such a helpful question. Oh, that was fantastic. Um, I was curious about, since you're historicizing all these concepts, um, how do you think about historicizing trans misogyny, homophobia, and misogyny yeah. um, in the context of primitive accumulation and modernity? Because yeah. clearly they too have these this changing conceptual history. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's, it's a really good question. You know, I'm I'm sort of toying with this way of on the one hand, you know, wanting to say like, well, there's a real history to a particular pattern of violence that bears down on trans women, mostly when they're poor and sex workers or are racialized, depending on the context. But it's not, it's not a fully distinct mode of violence, right? So, so on the one hand, I do, you know, to the extent that I'm a nominalist thinker in this project, it's merely out of a strategic 
need to, to name the thing and say it actually has been around for at least 150 years. And so that really matters politically. But as a matter of sort of history, then I'm actually extremely unattached to kind of drawing distinctions, right? So I think actually, you know, and this is this is sort of the feminist impulse, right? Trans misogyny and misogyny are actually like so closely linked. And actually what makes them different is actually the incorporation of homophobia into one of them, right? So, so much trans misogyny is actually a misgendering sexualization of trans women as male and a kind of gay panic attached to it. And that is, even though the punitive violence is feminizing in a way that violence against women more broadly often is too, as a way to shore up a kind of patriarchal hierarchy, right? The, the point is to me that they all kind of work together. But I think I'm really sort of provoked by something from Chitty's book, right? Which is sort of asking this question about how we understand moral panics and sort of uh, moral opprobriums that become justifications for violence historically, because often things like homophobia, right? Misogyny, transphobia, just kind of seem generic and ahistorical because of course they elicit our anger and we're not especially interested in taking them too seriously on their own terms, but then we often have no idea what sort of like this free floating often quasi religious idea that some people are just hateful and therefore like violent systems arise, right? Which is just like, uh, you know, and so what I really like that to, you know, to come back to, to, to the kind of work that thinks through primitive accumulation as a phase, right? In capitalist development that produces certain moral problems to deal with class antagonism, right? Because, and this is what Chitty's book is right about, starts in, you know, Florence and, you know, in, 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 in all the way back in the 15th century, when you have all these poor men flooding Florence with nothing to do, <clears throat> you know, they start, <laughs> excuse me, they start hooking up. <laughs> and that's like a problem for Florence to manage the threat. That's not really about the sex that they have per se. It's about the threat of them as a mass of uh, unpropertied bodies who could revolt against the Medicis. And so they create this complicated system to, of, you know, kind of accusations and fines to regulate sodomy, right? And I think that's a, a great way to understand the history of sex work more broadly as well, right? And, and the role of people whose lives play out um, as public lives, which is to say whose lives are sort of structurally dependent because of their lack of private property or domesticity on living on the streets, right? And that's a very long-lived history. So like the last chapter of this book I'm writing is about 1950s and 60s street queens, um, figures who are all over, say, like gay literature from the era, you know, like John Retchie's City of Night being kind of a titular one um, for me, where you just see like the idea that some people's lives like are street lives, like, well, where did that, where did that idea come from, right? And why is it both romanticized and reviled? And why is its fundamental feature vice cops and dangerous men? Right, um, like for reasons, right? Uh, well, to, to be crass, but yeah, for historical reasons. So, so I'm kind of interested, right? Not so much in sort of pinning down any of these three forms of of violence attached to moral rubrics, but rather to see that particular style of moralizing and social regulation and interpersonal violence as a product of yeah this broader kind of historical moment. So yeah, lovely. Thanks for setting me up to say that. <laughs> I think it kind of worked a little more smoothly than it has before, so I appreciate it. I mean, these have been big zoomed out questions, so feel free to ask more local questions too, if you want. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, no, th thanks for this, Jules. I mean, just effortlessly brilliant as always. Um, th this is kind of a banal question, but I actually think one I'm personally interested in, and I think maybe the grad students in the room might be too, just a methodological question. Yeah. You know, how do you go about, I mean, particularly just say Mary Jones as a figure, but it, you could sub, sub, sub in anything else you're working on. What, what's your process? I mean, what's your method of how, how do you dig into this figure? You know, this figure in the archives, uh, you know, what level of subjectivity are you looking for? I'm, you know, just kind of, if you could say a little more about how you do this work, it would, I think, be really productive. Thank you. No, I'm, I'm so grateful for the question because like, <laughs> I've like, you know, it's been on my mind. I've lost a lot of sleep over it. It is so hard, right? I mean, the problem with the Mary Jones archive is I actually think I don't believe a single thing in it, right? I mean, maybe, right? The most thing I'm the most attached to being true is her declaration in court. But even that, I don't know. Um, it's actually been very hard to read the original 
um, indictment. So, uh, mercy, you know, knock on wood, that's what I'm doing next Wednesday. So, you know, still waiting, been relying on these other scholars so far, you know, read all the press reports. You can do all this contextualizing work, but the problem is she's not a person in the archive. She's a, she's a figure, she's a satire, she's a device for other people's conversations. That's why I think Tourmaline's film is one of the only films that breaks that deadlock, but it does so you know, in the tradition of black speculation as art. It says, well, let's set aside reality because we need to imagine, to, to, to think of Mary Jones as a person, I would prefer to screen Silesia. Like, I don't think that is within my, my purview. I don't have that power as a historian. It's also, I mean, it might have the desire, but I think it's actually an inappropriate gesture for scholars and, and activists. And I think so much of how black trans women in particular are used up as rhetoric these days, including on the left, right? Makes them do things for people who are not them uh, is complicit with this long history of seeing black women and black femininity as itself such an illicit state of affairs that it's okay to steal it and use it for other purposes. So, so, but I admit, like, I hate that. I hate it, but I, you know, I was teaching a, a graduate seminar on the history of trans femininity this semester. And like, we spent a long time reading every single thing we could on Mary Jones. And it was just like, at the end of the session, we were like, great, we don't know anything about her. But now we know for sure that we know nothing about her. And that's okay, that's important. Right? There's a story there. But what's it a story of? That's why I'm really hesitating, for example, on how to write up her encounter with Haslam on the street. I mean, you know, because it's fiction for me to write it as a historian, right? I don't believe any of the primary sources I have on it. And, you know, I can approximate what I think those encounters were like at that era, because of course there's a lot of sex work going on. So, sure, you can corroborate outward but then you're getting further away from the person you, you're, you, you know, you're focused on. So you know, I think of it as an intractable problem. And I think that you know, part of the frustration, um, epistemological humiliation of research is to accept that, right? And to accept that it, it's not within our agency to repair that harm. That's not what we're here to do. Um, and so what knowledge we want to make with someone's with the record of someone's life, with the record, especially in the case of a book about misogyny, right? I'm really reckoning with like, what kind of evidence does violence leave behind? And, you know, what do you want to do with that affirmatively? I think it's important just to say like, look, this violence is real. It has a long history. Mary Jones is a key person. Great. But then what, right? I mean, so, so I think, you know, again, I, I, I want to think of myself both being able to be a critic and saying like, hey, Jonathan Katz, like that, that was bad. I don't, I don't agree. I think that, you know, it was a while ago, but it wasn't as long ago as you think, um, you know, uh, but, but then like, you know, to Tourmaline or Willis and to people, you know, thinking through what Mary Jones can do today, that's really important, right? And, and some of that doesn't need to be historically accurate. In fact, it shouldn't be because historical accuracy is only going to work in one particular modality. And so, you know, I think it's a, it's, but it's a painful lesson, you know? I mean, I think I was probably just well prepared for it because my first book is just like based in the worst archives I could have possibly gone to, the most vicious, horrible doctors and psychiatrists, you know, to ever see children who just oversaw, you know, just some of the worst stuff that I still don't know how to talk about out loud, right? So I was sort of like, well, you know, that's trans archives for you, not very fun. Um, but 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 I think you know, it's it's a it's a difficult methodological question about how to work with that level of complexity without actually paralyzing your ability to think, right? So that that to me is the riddle. Um, one of the ways I'm trying to deal with it, I guess, this is the last thing I'll say on that is sort of to scale up and down as need be, right? So when Mary Jones's story burns out because I don't believe any of it, let me scale out and say, okay, but actually knowing about what we can't know about her helps me understand Jenny June better, right? And so it's this like careful. And then when the New York story burns out, let's go over to British India, where there's a, uh, you know, a different project of trying to eliminate hijras in the late 19th century. Then let's go to federal Indian Bureau agents who are, you know, attempting to eradicate different, you know, two-spirit um, cultural traditions in real time. So, you know, there's something like that too, the sort of mania of the, of, of the scholar, right, where you could be like, I'm hitting a brick wall, you know, star wipe, let's go to a new location, right? And then, then you got to figure out the suture, of course. But, but I think there's, you know, 
it's tricky. It's not, I will say this, it's not fun. I don't enjoy that. It makes me sad actually, but then it also does feel immensely rewarding um, because, you know, I guess ultimately, and I'm really invested in this in this moment where I think the overexposure of trans people, especially trans women of color does us no service. You know, I'm glad we don't know anything more about Mary Jones because that means like her life did belong to her in a certain way. It's not for us. Like, it's just not, you know, her life is, she's not for us. We're not entitled to the people we write about, right? Um, and so, you know, I wouldn't wish it to have happened that way, but, you know, since it did, I'm kind of okay to be like, these are my limitations and I'm going to stick with them out of deference, right? Out of respect, out of reverence too. Um, and then, you know, I'll leave it to the artists like Tourmaline to, to, to inspire me to imagine her otherwise. Um, yeah, something like that. <laughs> all right, so let's say thanks again, Jules. That was excellent. Well, thank you all so much. I'm happy to have you back. Really great. And some really good advice about the archive <laughs> and good question, right? Um, so let's transition to our next panel, our Why Pop Culture Studies Matters, close to my heart. We'll take two minutes or so, do what we need to do, and we'll get going. This room is the most mic. Monday, Tucson.
you want to come yell at me, they can. <laughs> I just saw you. Sorry about that. You all good? <laughs> You're like, what is happening? Like, where are these people? All good? All right, guys. So our last roundtable today is Why Pop Culture Studies Matters uh, with PhD candidate Larry Durst, MA student Destiny Jones, moderator Witt Strube, PhD student Victoria Timpanaro, and PhD student Corey Clausen. This is very close to my heart, though. Maybe the nicest thing anybody said about my book that I take pop culture seriously, um, and that's why I was very excited for this panel to hear how you guys are going to take pop culture seriously. So I'm going to hand it off to you, Wet. Yeah, sure. Um, hey, everybody. I'm Witt Strube. I'm in the History Department and also American Studies and Women's and Gender Studies. It's my honor to uh, chair or moderate our final panel um, on why pop culture studies matters. I'll say as little as possible. My job here is basically to uh, feed some questions now and then and pass the mic around and keep time. By the unanimous request of the uh, panel, I'm going to hold panelists to three minutes per response. So if I look authoritarian, it's by request, not um, a flailing extension of power. Um, so anyway, yeah, I, 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 um, I'll keep my introductory comments extremely short, and then we'll go around and have everybody introduce themselves, and then I'll start sort of feeding questions. Um, you know, we're living in a moment of obviously reactionary backlash to knowledge, um, knowledge of all sorts, particularly scholarly knowledge from climate science to LGBTQ studies. Um, this is something I think everybody in this room is tangibly and palpably aware of. Um, and, and so I think that's the context in which the, the question of why popular culture studies matters takes on a sort of double layer of meaning and resonance, right? I mean, in one sense, we all have to answer that question of why our work matters, but there's a sort of particularly um, heightened level at which the, the, the claims of importance and relevance of popular culture studies may not be as obvious as some other fields. You know, for folks who are working on anti-imperialism, decolonization, um, you know, things like that, which obviously do seep into popular culture studies as well, you know, their claims to political relevance are maybe just firsthand um, directly obvious. You know, we have to take a little bit of a more defensive posture at times, I think, to articulate why the work we do counts. So that, that's the framework that we're um, sort of using here, I think. Um, I, th I thought I, instead of me introducing everybody, we could all just introduce ourselves and um, pass the mic around for that, and, and then we'll launch into questions. So I don't know which order, because you put me in the middle where, um, <laughs> where folks want. Larry, why don't we just start with you, if you don't mind. Is that working? Um, for those who don't know me, I'm, I'm Larry Durst, and I am a PhD student, and I am currently working on my dissertation, which to Witt's point about you know, trying to defend the relevance, I am writing about 1960 sitcoms, which are about the silliest, maybe the most trivial things you could almost imagine. So um, I think about this question of this panel all the time. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Destiny Jones. Um, I'm a master's student here for American Studies, and I'm on the public humanities track. Uh, goal of working in museums. So for my thesis project, I'm actually working on the sitcom Good Times <laughs> um, as a museum exhibit. Um, I think that sometimes it's kind of lost that humanities is studying humans, and there's so many different routes that that needs to be done. Even in the creative route, it still needs to be studied. So I think this is great table. <laughs> Hi, uh, Victoria Timpanero. Um, I am PhD, PhD student, American studies. Um, my focus is on women in horror and science fiction media. Um, and I completely and utterly relate to the concept that people don't get why that's important, because <laughs> that's, I think I'm answering that question all the time. So um, what I look for is uh, what I see as a trajectory of change. Um, in going from a concept of women as damsel in distress to women as heroes and women as empowered figures. Uh, and I think that science fiction and horror are ways that we as society deal with everything else that goes on in our existences and how we deal with it internally and how we can put it on a page or put it on a screen in a way to uh, kind of exercise those feelings. And um, seeing how we place gendered figures within that is very important to me, and I think it should be important. Um, but yeah, that's why I think for me it matters. Corey? Uh, hi, I'm Corey Clausen. I'm a first year in this program. 
my uh, MA is in comparative literature, and I'm coming at this from a fairly different angle. Um, my main project is digital methods and studying queer histories. My main project, Archive Pelago, um, parses archival finding aids for mentions of queer writers. So I um, map the connections in terms of correspondence, but also translations and other collaborations. Um, but what brings me here today is uh, the idea that um, we can find continuity, we can find um, in pop cu popular culture um, opportunities to evaluate our ideas, treat them as a crucible that we can understand or uh, find some sort of lens for understanding the other things we're working on, whether that be queer failure or um, identifying it thematically with uh, parallel systems of oppression. I think that it's really productive to turn towards literature, but also uh, popular culture because it's, uh, it's popular, uh, the, the, because uh, it's part, or, part of a wider conversation that is incredibly valuable. Great. No, it's, I mean, it, it's, it's wonderful being amongst so many exciting projects that people are working on. And to get the ball rolling, um, this you cannot possibly consider this a curveball question, although it's a difficult one. Why does popular culture studies matter? As, as, you know, let's start with the most macro abstract level. Corey, I don't know if that was your answer to that question already, maybe, but let's start with you and work this way. I mean, if you just want to field that off the top, and then we'll get more granular as we go. Yeah, I, like I said, um, thinking of it as a thinking of popular culture as a crucible, a lens through which we, we might evaluate our own ideas, uh, find thematic continuity in the histories the, and the stories around us. I think is is a key aspect of popular cultural studies that I find useful. Um, not sure I have much more to add to that. <laughs> So I kind of already answered that in the context of horror and science fiction as genres, but I think in pop culture more kind of broadly, I feel that it's a, um, it does two things. It tells us what, what do we think right now and what do we used to think? And that not just necessarily to a time, but also to a place. How did people feel about the world around them, about women in the world around them in, I don't know, 1960s and 70s UK when the Hammer was making uh, vampire films, you know, like, and, and it shows something about how we, how we read it now also depicts how we kind of feel too. So the ability to look at pop culture as a way to understand the past, but also to understand the lenses we're using today. I completely agree with everything. She took the words right out of my mouth. But I think the only thing that I would add is that pop culture has this multiple platforms that it could be used through. And when it comes to writing books or movies, TV shows, video games, comic books, it's all a different way that you have to convey that lesson that you're trying to get off or that message. And I think that the reason to me that pop culture has to be studied other than the time frame is how that one topic can change over time and how they how directors and writers and these different people and these different roles decide to use that platform because you can have this one topic and do something completely different no matter the different way that you decide to portray it to the public. So I think that um, audience is something too where television shows especially, they have this you know exact audience to it and we have these guidelines for that reason. It means that the writers have to put the, that audience in mind. And that's very different from things from a historical sense where everything is meant to be factual and accuracy and supposed to be that anybody reading this is just learning you know, more right or wrong or truth about some kind of matter. Where when it comes to popular culture, it doesn't necessarily have to be a right or a wrong. You can follow a, a super villain or you can follow a hero and still learn the same type of message throughout the story. Uh, so I feel like it depends on the platform and that change of time, like she was saying. Um, yes, to all that. And I go back to what Corey said um, initially that, you know, it's because it's popular. And I think about, um, I don't know, I wish there was a, uh, if any uh, classic scholars in the room, you know, was it Socrates who said, know thyself? Um, because I think for us to know ourselves as, as a nation with, with American studies, um, as much as we can generalize on that, probably one of the best places to look is what is most popular, right? What has moved 
and where would we found meeting on mass as much as we can do that. Um, I also want to say one other thing, and that is um, um, to Witt's point earlier about why it matters now, I think is what Witt, Witt was talking about. And a couple of weeks ago, um, I'm going to look at Ruth Belstein here. Um, Ruth and I were teaching a class on the backlash against um, gay and women's rights in the 1970s. And we were doing that through some popular culture. We were doing that through you know, the Village People YMCA. We were doing that through um, All in the Family. We were doing that through the disco demolition night, you know, at, at Comiskey Park um, in 19, what was it, 1979, I believe. Um, and Ruth said something at the end of the class, which is, I realized now, I, I finally realized why it matters now. And, and what she said was that um, we, if we were in Florida right now at the end of this class, which was a, you know, a tough subject, it was an incredibly engaged class. If we were in Florida right now, we might not be able to have had this class, this conversation. And it struck me that not just as scholars, but as teachers, which I, I begin to think of myself more as a teacher, how important it is to teach critical thinking just critical thinking about the world around us when that is the absolute thing that so many people are trying to stress at this moment. So I think it's really relevant right now. I can keep uh, feeding questions if you want, but I didn't know if you were going to follow up on anybody else's comments. Um, I made a comment when we first started meeting about how uh, history itself is kind of shaping these platforms for popular culture, but also today is shaping them as well. How crazy it was to me when the pandemic did hit and now all of our commercials, people are wearing masks and now it's in TV shows where we're seeing those characters go through the pandemic, even with just modernism of technology overall. Like we're starting to see a lot of the things that we're kind of just grasping today in the television shows and movies we watch and the books we read. And I think that Sometimes people don't think about how what you're writing, you know, if you are an author, how that is shaping the future and how it's shaping that view of it. So um, I think that that's an interesting take on how pop culture matters too, because we're also kind of painting the future. Whoever is reading this stuff, they're going to view 2022 exactly how we were to write it today. And the idea that the average person can have a thought that, you know, no one else is going to hear or read or see. So in the future when they come back and they look at everything, just the pop culture, because that's what they're going to see as popularly known. This is what everyone in that generation, in that time period, in that area viewed that subject as, then it's going to be kind of written down and historicized <laughs> by how we write it. Yeah, I, I could add to that also. Um, something that came up in that when we had that discussion was um, how we see that now and even in modern like modern times like current history the um i think like many of us during uh the past few years there's been a lot of rewatching and, and and kind of going through things media that we love and and seeing moments as we're going through a massive moment in time seeing how those moments are kind of encapsulated has it kind of it's this constant reminder um you know watching a show that took place uh right after 9-11 and how it was approached, watching um, films that take place in that time period and how it changes, but also even like how you can track technology through popular culture. Um, as somebody who studies horror, I mean like things like Scream, like that's a film that's perpetuated on the fact that the one kid is assumed to be the victim, the, the parent, sorry, the parent of the kid is assumed to be the, the person who caused the initial crime because he had a cell phone, right? And that's just like kind of wild now. It's like, oh my God, that one man in town had a cell phone. How awful, you know, like, but, but it gives us a, a frame of reference too. It reminds us of these things. There's a, a commonality in kind of current making of horror to, uh, to harken back to a time before now because of that one thing, because of the cell phone. It's the ability to move away from all the bad things that we go deal we can we could possibly deal with, and it's a technology that we have as a roadblock. So we we that's why there's this kind of massive movement of, kind of, 
making things that happened in the 70s and 80s today. Because, oh, okay, well, if they just had a cell phone, they could get out of this, they'd call the cops, they'd be done, the movie would be over. But it, it's contextualizing and it's helping us kind of figure out like, all right, well, if this was back then, how would we do that? So I think that's also how, why we today are still making media that's gonna talk about the past has a lot to do with what we're going through and, and trying to figure out, well, what does that fit into the grander scheme of things? And then I think what we see in pop culture today definitely kind of also shapes our opinions of the past. I do wanna jump on something you said at the very beginning of your comment, Victoria, about um, a lot of us rewatching things and as part of the pandemic. This, to, to return to the point of why is popular culture studies important right now? What did we all do that first year of lockup? <laughs> we were on our phones, we were watching things, we were often returning to the things that, uh, that comforted us most uh, when dealing with trauma. So, um, <laughs> or, <laughs> or Tiger King, whatever, whatever, whatever uh, we, were, uh, we did to, to get through. I mean, <laughs> um, so, I think it's in, that really it reflects the the importance of this panel in a different way. That, yeah, <laughs> we we use it to relate to connect uh, to wider society when <laughs> there's a total absence of it. That's a way that it functions in the here and now. That that I think is important to this discussion. Let me, let me grind my own axe and throw it uh, at you and see what you think. One, <laughs> One, one of the ways that I feel that a certain strain of cultural studies descends into irrelevance is, is by taking a sort of purely linguistic turn and purely representational turn and detaching from political economy such that cultural texts just become grist for the theory mill. Um, you saw a lot of this in the 1980s and 90s, I think. Every Madonna video was a transgressive deconstruction of sexuality. Every Hollywood movie was. Um, you know, there's a book about television and Reaganism that begins with the scholar saying, I spent the 1980s doing the most radical thing imaginable, watching television, and I don't think she was kidding. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, it, it, it's always, it, that, that, that's always been sort of frustrating to me, and I wonder how you avoid that in your own work, you know, sort of, you know, sliding into uh, a, a sort of form of analysis that's not connected to political economy, um, you know, that, that, that isn't materialist in, in nature. Um, or, or feel free to push back and, you know, challenge my premises. I mean, to, that, that's fine too. Just throwing it at you and seeing what you think. Well, it's, it's funny because there's, we were actually talking earlier today, we have one of our conversations was not just how we avoid that, but also how we avoid our own personal nostalgia trap as well. But perhaps that's the difference between what we're attempting to do, I guess, as scholars, um, and maybe just more popular critical writing about, about popular culture, which looks at the, at the, at the thing itself, but it's, and, and maybe it's aesthetic work. But I do think that um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the keynote, right, the end, bringing it back to the capitalist field, right? I mean, that we all live in. And I, I find in my work that almost becomes inevitable for some reason. Um, to try and look at the larger field that this is, again, the material field that this exists in. Um, I don't know that I begin there, but I find, I, I mean, again, I'm, I've been spending the last months, like three or four months, writing about Gilligan's Island. And um, again, I bet everyone here could sing the Gilligan's Island theme song, probably. I don't know who's like I said, shaking no. Um, that goes back ways. Um, but what I keep coming back to is I'm now reading it as really talking about, you know, the change in both broadcast history in power shifts, which is representative of the shift in capitalism at the time. So to me, I don't know, it just pops up, you know, when, when you place it in the context. Okay, just want to make sure. Um, I think for me, it was a little bit different. Uh, I'm working with good times, like I said, but um, I get caught up in the story. I'm, I'm crying at how much Florida and James love each other. And um, it was much harder for me to get out of that to actually like analyze it instead of just watching it. And um, 
the hardest part was really the idea that um, James's character, the actor whose name I always forget. Anyone remember? John Amos? It's John Amos. He, uh, he leaves the show halfway through because he doesn't like how JJ's character is played. And um, that has a huge effect on the show itself because he leaves exactly in the middle, which is something that no one would have knew was happening but they end up killing his character off right in the middle of season three, going into season four. And it causes this huge change where it's this big climax. It's before when they had a father who was present and alive and after where they don't have a father. And um, seeing that as something more, the, the other side of it, of trying to understand more of why he left and how that affected the show from almost like a political standpoint, I could have done <laughs> But I feel like I was really focused on the work at hand and how him doing that still affected the show itself without having to get into the politics of it. So I think there was this way of needing to kind of decide what was important, what wasn't. And Kyle can say that is the hardest part for me in this project. But I think that um, as like analysts, and I feel like it's hard to say it that way because we're, we're researchers and we're also doing this as passions, but as analysts, when you're watching a show this closely or a movie or reading a book or maybe listening to a song, I think you're picking apart more than people even realize. And once you have this list of all these things, this one thing could mean, that's when you can really see what parts are political and what parts are more just kind of like, let's just focus on the show. But it definitely, that was one of the things that really tore me apart, my own bias and how I felt about things and how I wanted to view the show myself rather than this third party view of one that everyone could understand and also see and then even thinking about the audience in that sense of what views do they have are they laughing at the show while they're watching it or are they just enjoying it so I think there's just like these different lenses that as you kind of analyze it you just decide what needs to be put away but you end up with way more information than you need either way <laughs> follow up on that for a quick second I just, just the, the idea of killing off the character I mean just had me thinking um we're both sitcom you're the sitcom thing off the table um about shows that where they either kill off the character or like the Bewitched, which I'm also writing about, where they replace the actor who playing the lead character. And it just makes me wonder, like, from a political standpoint, who gets killed off and who gets replaced? I mean, it just like, gives me a fascinating idea project. I could kind of go on that too, because a lot of a lot of the films that I'm looking at are parts of long series of films. So it's like, who makes it to the sequel is a big deal. And sometimes that's a very kind of internal political thing as well. Or who is just decided to be less important and who can we drop? But who do we need to bring in to, to make kind of make up for that? And especially when you think of uh, kind of teen horror of like the 80s and 90s, it's, it's very much driven by the popularity contest of it too. It's like, well, let's bring in this person because, you know, uh, you know, Let's bring in a pop singer or a, you know a rapper or somebody who can kind of grab audience, and how doing that can be more important than maybe paying for Jamie Lee Curtis in this one. You know, like you know, let's, how how do we kind of that's the politics I think of is budgetary, kind of the capitalistic po politics of if we have the budget, are we spending it on the people? Are we spending it on the effects? Are we or are we doing this for in in my purview of like direct-to-video world of lowest budget possible. And what does that mean when you're, you're dealing in, in kind of this capitalistic mode of, we have $500 to make this movie and we're gonna make it work. Or we have a big budget Hollywood production and how do we, what is more important to us? Putting all of that on the screen or using it to pay for get, to get people to watch that film. So capitalism to me is more the kind of all those decisions, the budgetary decisions before the film is really even started and kind of um, if we're a world of marketing, is how does that play in? Um, I also kind of think of the, there's always like the flip side of that is the box office. Was that film successful enough to make enough money back to go and make another one? Um, did that film tank and ruin your career and now you can't get the money to make your next film? These are kinds of things that particularly somebody in genre film has to worry about because it's gonna make it even that much harder to do the inevitable try to get out of genre film, um, which that's all capitalism because that's keeping people within, uh, you know, keeping a director or a writer in a box and saying, you're a horror person, you can't do anything else. You're a science fiction person, you can't do anything else. You worked on Star Trek or whatever for how many years? 
yeah, you're not going to make, make a, a family drama. That's not going to happen. So those kind of politics of the world of, we say Hollywood, but much of this is outside of, far outside of Hollywood, but those kind of driving factors of how does money incorporate and then to go through all that and then say, well, how does society feel about that at the same time? Um, are you in a period of time where you're making a film that's not going to be socially acceptable because there's violence and gore and whatnot? And, or, you know, are you going to be, you know, there's a lot of, these are the capitalism things I think of, I guess you could say, is, is how all that impacts what you can make with what you have to work with. Again, I think I have a lot <laughs> in common with you on uh, our approach to this question. I, I, it's impossible to disentangle the uh, narrative economy from the cultural economy in which a product is made. Um, there are uh, a couple of examples that come to mind are, I mean, what gets made and what, uh, what taboos are, are what <laughs> ideas are censored or encoded so as to not, <laughs> So, so as to be allowed to produce the thing in the first place. For instance, um, there's this, uh, oh, I've, I've written about um, Brian Fuller, a TV director, uh, uh, does a lot of horror and, but also science fiction and fantasy stuff. Uh, and how when he, with Heroes, with uh, Dead Like Me, with Pushing Daisies, there were all of these queer storylines that were, um, were eliminated in the, during the writing process, uh, but also um, with say pushing daisies encoded. There's this whole um, throughout all of these or most of these, you have a, a, a female character, typically the romantic lead, who is uh, given a traditionally male name like Chuck or Michael in the case of Star, Star Trek Discovery. And um, we're left as viewers, as scholars to sort of think about that, think about some of those decisions and, and how they were informed by the, the production process. And I think there's, there's a lot, uh, that, that's how I, that's one way I, that I keep the reality, um, keep, keep things grounded um, is, <laughs> and not focus entirely on, on the narrative economy or the narrative um, significance of, of a given cultural work. So this may be, again, the historian in me speaking, but um, I mean, it seems to me that maybe a cumulative consensus here is, is that part of the importance of this work is sort of tracking the production and circulation of social imaginaries, right? Whether it's the anxieties reflected in horror films, the kind of domestic ideals reflected in sitcoms. Um, and, and I wonder, you know, how, are, are social imaginaries an, an overly nebulous way to think about, about popular culture? In other words, you can take Pose and say, well, okay, here's a show that shows the sort of mainstreaming of, of trans identity, but I'm going to guess here, and I feel like I'm, it's a fairly good guess, there, there are probably a lot of Trump voters who watch Pose, right? I mean, who, you know, people who are concerned about groomers and, and you know, trans bathroom access who love these shows. And so, I mean, how, how do we unpack the, the meaning, the historical meaning of the social imaginaries that we're talking about, or, or are they important just as imaginaries under themselves? Is that still important inherently, regardless of how it's sort of processed and perceived by, by the mass audience? Um, an interesting note that I feel like my professors who are helping me on my thesis project have said to me is just this idea of, well, in order for the show to actually stay on the air, majority had to have watched it. And for good times in the time period of the 70s, that majority would have probably been white. <laughs> so to me, it was hard to think that people could watch the show and like, like I said earlier, like laugh at it in the sense of like laughing at them for being poor or anything they do in their lives. But um, to me, because of my bias, I'm like, no, this is great. I love them. Everything's great. This is a great show. So I think that it does matter in the sense of from that political sense of you have to have an audience that's willing to watch it. They have to like it in order for it to keep going. And just like what she's saying before, um, what Victoria was saying about these movies, that if they're going to keep going, people are going to need to like them. But I think that that's also what makes the pop culture study so important about it, because we can look at them from outside of that lens. Because looking at that lens alone, it kind of takes away some of that fun that we all need from it in order to enjoy it. 
Yeah, that to me that that's again those two different approaches, right? The production side and the re audience reception side. Um, and do they ever really jibe in, in a sense? Um, and that's one thing I'm grappling with myself now. I mean, I, I, I'm I'm actually dealing with the production side. I'm looking at how characters are made, um, you know, in that period. Um, and again, it goes to questions of authorship within what is a beyond collaborative, right, right, a commercially productive medium. Um, so I'm also looking for that authorship. But at the same time, the question is, do I have to look at the reception side of, of that as well? Or can I just simply ignore it and tell that one half the story? I don't know that I quite answered the question. But to me, the, I do see them as separate questions. But how do I bring them together, I guess? Kind of two things kind of come to mind. Um, in on one hand, you have the periods like um, of demonization, right? So uh, you have in late seventies, early eighties, you know, you have that the anti uh, anti horror feminist movement. So you have the the concept that uh, this kind of new con new style of slasher films is anti woman, and so you have this kind of immediate reaction to it you have to kind of understand in the time period why people felt that way and how a generation like mine who grows up in a fandom of that same thing that women then were fighting against see a flip side and we see the kind of heroicism of the women in those films kind of aside from what are the obvious misogynistic moments within but we're looking at it from two different perspectives and finding different things uh, the other thing I think about also in kind of that idea of the po politicizing of the audience and all of that, um, when we bring up like kind of queer characters and queer storylines, there's been a, um, a definite kind of insurgence of, I want to say resurgence, but it's not really true because it didn't really happen before as, as kind of openly in horror of queer stories and queer characters, which were very coded in the past. And now there is some backlash if you read the forums and if you read all that, same thing in comic books where they're, when you're including queer characters, people kind of, you know, fight against it. Why why you have to bring that to my comic book? And, and you get this idea of this kind of like very stereotypically Republican Trumper kind of audience that's against this happening. But at the same time, those comic books are selling really well. You know, the, these movies have a lot of people coming to see them. There's a lot of people who really, really love and appreciate what's going on with the new, um, Chucky series because it has a very kind of queer trans storyline going on within it. And there's a lot of people who are rallying around that, even though you see that. So it's, it's this kind of disappropriateness, right? Like it's just, we're, we're seeing the loudest voices of this kind of anti everything. You know, I want it to all to stay the way it was in my kind of straight male, white, cis way. And, and, you know, we don't want, we don't want anything that reflects women having power or, or, people of color having dominance or, or, you know, like any of these kind of whatever we assume, I guess, is true of these kind of dominantly re Republican white male audience. But I, for as much as that we see and we hear and we read these negative comments, these films are still doing well. These comics are still doing well. These TV shows are still doing well. So it, yeah, the majority is still, like, like Destiny says, I mean, it had to have a majority to do well and, and to make more. So I, I think the proof is more in the box office than uh, kind of the rhetoric. To continue that, um, I think there's a certain, to uh, uh, the theme out here of toxic fandom and ownership uh, is, is key, you, that um, you can't take my thing and, may and, uh, and reproduce the politics I disagree with. Um, I think that, there's a whole segment here and a whole, uh, I don't have much to add to this conversation, but um, th that those conversations are val a valuable um, uh, site for, for examination of these systems oppression, of oppression as they try to sort of colonize the imaginary. Um, I, wanna, I wanna follow up on that and Victoria about this idea of popularity um, and, and, and box office. But that also, to me, begs the question 
are, are some of these storylines can mass popular culture. I think you have to make a distinction a little bit between mass and much more targeted, which is much more common today. Um, can it be subversive or must it, is it inherently hegemonic, right? I mean, so are these storylines popular? Are they affecting people to change minds? I mean, are they, are they purposely attempting political statements? I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of a, one of the mantras I keep in mind doing this is something Warren Berlant wrote, which was the counter politics of the silly object. And you know, can these sort of things that we, we started out by saying is almost trivial, can they sort of have a counter politics to them? And does it affect those different audiences or do people just come in and will leave with what they want to leave with what they came in with? I don't know. Um, I think that I think that there's this way they have to live together in the sense of it, it, it's, it's about both if it's even going to be seen as, as good. And it's up to the person watching or reading or listening to decide how they feel on it anyway. So I think as a writer, as someone who's actually producing this type of pop culture content, it's, you're never really going to know if people are going to like it or not. I think it's more about pleasing some people. And it's kind of necessary to make sure you're hitting those big marks in order for the whole thing to just go well. And then I think it becomes what can you slip in under the people's noses? And that's what surprises them and catches them off guard and maybe it works. And um, I really wish we could talk about like specific, I don't know if you guys have seen Fear Street. Um, I don't know if you saw Fear Street. It's a, a newer slasher film. It's a 2020. 2021, I believe is when it came out. And um, the main characters are a lesbian couple. And this is something that's new for a slasher film. But even in the same sense, there's a lot of just kind of these stereotypical ways that their relationship works. And I think that in order to introduce something new, you kind of need something that's stereotypical too for it to lean off of in order for people to even understand the concept and be able to allow it. Because I think that's the whole point. It has to be allowed by the majority in order for it to continue. But even going to my own research, um, JJ's character in Good Times is looked down upon a lot because of his mannerisms, his dynamite, his catchphrases, and just how minstrelism mirrors the way that he played his role. And a lot of people didn't watch it because of that. And then you can get into politics of, well, was it the white audience that felt this way or the black audience? Or you know, how, how was this interpreted by most of the people? But there's also this other lens of what I'm kind of doing with my project, which is looking at him as a character, as someone where those are just his traits. He's just someone who chases girls and he's a funny guy and that's how he likes to express himself. And even doing that is not something that's gonna be easy for everyone to kind of step aside from and not see him in these minstrels and like manners, but it's still important for both. And that's when it goes connecting into the timeline of you know who put this content out and why did they write JJ's characters that way? But I also wrote in my project at one point, well, what if JJ was played by a different actor? Would he have played the character differently or was it written that way? So I think that there's just, there's too many moving parts to know what even makes film successful or what makes it likable. But for the most part, if there aren't those classic storylines where we know that maybe the girl's gonna die at the end or something like that, it's, there's nothing for the person watching it to even hold to it to know if it's going to be different from what they've seen before. So I feel like those surprises where we're caught off guard because we didn't think that person would live in the movie, that's how we're going to get them. And when it comes to analyzing, those are the things I think we're writing about because those stereotypes that kind of keep going on and on, those are the ones that we've already heard of and seen before. And that's where pop culture comes in too because to me, it's comparing how that has changed over time. Because um, Good Times, this is like one of the first black families to be on TV. So for this time period, minstrelism, it's kind of all we've seen beforehand. Uh, Andy, Andy and Amos, I believe that's what it's called. It's the only other show that was on before then and it was canceled after like one season for being horribly racist. <laughs> so even with that, that was the only representation that they saw. And now you have Good Times, which is a show that even today, a lot of people can still feel for, they feel for the characters, they can enjoy the storyline. We've gone through some of the same things, but for the time period that was still seen as, you know, like 
too much for JJ's character. And to the point where not only does um, John Amos leave, but Esther Rowe leaves too, just because of JJ's character. So there's just, there's so much that goes into why I feel like they kind of have to live together, but also the idea that if you don't have those basic stereotypes or some kind of guideline to go off of, then people wouldn't watch it. Yeah, actually to play off what you were talking about, Destiny with, with Amos and Andy, that's, uh, that's a definite show of like the times changing, right? When it comes to TV uh, and the NAACP uh, works to rally with many other organizations to remove it. Uh, but before that, it was the most popular radio show and uh, like massive listening ship, like the most popular show with the most sponsors and all that. So in the radio format and the radio time period, it was acceptable. And, you know, once we make that shift, you know, a decade later, it no longer works in our society. So yeah, we see like change like that. Um, or even when someone tries to make uh, something that doesn't move with the times, it doesn't, it doesn't always work, it fails within genre work. Or we see these kind of moments of change happen again, like, like Corey, you're, you're bringing up like Michael and Star Trek, but thinking of Star Trek as an entity as each incarnation of Star Trek has had a vastly different cast, a vastly different um, kind of world of the people within it, and that culturally it tries to keep up with time changing as a as a program, and people aren't always happy with that change. Um, yeah, the, the 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 very kind of toxic culture of fandom right there. Like, as soon as you said that, I went Star Trek. Yeah, exactly. Um, but it's part of the, that world that we don't like change. When our programs we love change, it doesn't always happen easy for us. And and I think that's another thing is you, you see how how audiences react to those changes and then react to, in different time periods to things is very important too. So I do want to be sure we have time to open discussion to the floor. Um, maybe I'll just throw one more question at you and then we can see if folks um, in the audience want to, to jump in. You know, clearly you're working with a wide variety of approaches here at this very table from, you know, archival research into production to sort of, you know, theory-driven analyses of, of texts. Um, this is the classic American studies conundrum, right? So as scholars working on popular culture studies, what what is your scholarly home? You know, what what what... What do you see as your scholarly community and where does this work fit into, you know, the neoliberal austerity driven academy of 2022? Okay. Um, <laughs> so um, my bachelor's, I doubled in history and English writing. And then I came here to a master's in American studies with this public humanities track. And I think public, I mean, I think that American studies is the home for it. But I mean, that's in the, safe, the case that I'm studying American television. So um, I think that in my classes, as a, in my bachelor's, I had a hard time differentiating. I had a hard time writing for my English classes and my history classes because they seemed so separate. Like writing for English, it was, I did, um, I did writing, so it was a lot of workshops, my own poetry, my own short stories. And then history, things were factual, but also just the format of APA and then MLA format. Like it, it just felt like completely different fields. It wasn't until I got to American studies where I felt like I could branch them both together. And it was, it was such a hard time in my writing. I think even till now, I still feel like I'm switching tracks where now I'm an English person and now I'm a history person. And that, you know, humanities as a whole I guess that's what grounds me. I always think about humanities being the study of humans and that these are just kind of these different lenses and American studies allowed me to do both because that's what it's meant to be. So that's where I think my home is. It's kind of like asking the question, yeah. is interdisciplinarity a discipline? You know, it, and um, I struggle with that myself. I mean, how to write, what method am I using? What methods am I using? And I've actually found where I'm gravitating towards, and we'll see if this holds up, so I'm still at the beginning, is I'm actually writing chapters that each is approached different. So a theoretical grounding, so it's like you know, on theory, there's a much more historical chapter, uh, you know, that sets the ground, the material grounding, and there's an analytical, you know, and then hopefully one that sort of pulls it all together. But I, it's, it's, it's a difficult thing, you know, what, what field, what discipline are we working in? 
Um, I, I very much identify with this uh, notion of the interdisciplinarity being a home. I'm reminded of I, my undergraduate thesis was on Elizabeth Bishop, how she lived in Brazil, but um, it, but um, she never really felt like home anywhere in some ways. There was this connection between her childhood and Nova Scotia and Brazil. So I um, argued for a sort of unhomeliness. And I think that that sort of sums up my own experience as well. I, I was trained as an English in English and Portuguese studies, so language and literatures. So I found myself in a comparative literature program, which never really felt like home because it felt like there wasn't, uh, for me, a, a balance in terms of the, the texts and the, the theory. Um, so coming here, um, I, I had the unique opportunity to, to sort of engage with, with um, history as a praxis and um, learning all the basics like, like um, <laughs> literature and historiography are very similar and function similarly. Um, and to take the research seminar this semester and realize, oh, some of this is really intuitive and feels, feels right. Um, that's that's the, <laughs> the sort of homemaking that I, I'm discovering within this program. Uh, yeah, come, come study with us. Uh, as far as the interdisciplinariness of everything, um, I double majored uh, as an undergrad all the way through. So uh, in both film and video, uh, digital film, when that was a new thing, and um, music. So um, I come from two worlds that uh, when I went on to my master's, I, I focused on media studies. When I did my, my, my research and my work, I created a, a documentary. So it was a, a matter of collecting information from people directly and, and interviewing. And then um, years later when I wanted to do, because I, I missed that experience of interviewing these people and talking to these people about filmmaking in that time period and, and the movies that I love, I wanted to, to kind of dive in again, but I wanted to have a, a focus this time more or less on the women who were behind these films and the, the kind of their story and change in that way. And I decided the best way to do that would be to give myself kind of the, the constraints of doing it within another discipline of, of finding a way to learn how to do this better. And quite frankly, have my project kind of worked into something that would get me at least a degree out of it. But um, the idea of kind of learning how to do the right part of all that work behind it to make sure I wasn't doing it wrong and doing it the correct way. So part of what I do is through interviews. And I think that's a very important thing. And it wasn't really till I took Mary's class here that I, I understood what oral history really meant and how one creates that and how that's an important archive of its own and puts these people's stories straight. You know, it kind of gives them the opportunity to tell their own. And that's an important part of what I think I have to do besides the research of yeah, all the production information and the time period it's from and how it affects because my overarching ideas of, well, how does feminism change over decades and how does filmmaking change on top of the, the kind of the world of what's going on in feminism? The ability to talk to people about that is what's important to me. So I think American studies makes sense for a way to kind of learn how to do all that together. And it, oh, and I just want to say that it turned out that uh, right when I was doing that, I found out a million other people were doing the same thing. So <laughs> it just became a very popular topic right when I was trying to do it. <laughs> so it always happens. <laughs> um, no, that's great. Thanks, everybody. Um, comments or questions from the floor? Anything? Hey, Rachel uh, Scoblin. So two questions. Um, number one, I had to step out. If it's if it's okay with you, could you uh, repeat us your I guess thesis um, so that way I like can grasp onto it. And the second part of my question is, what's something in your work that like you were analytically excited by that you discovered or found or connected, and what's something that you're uh, at tension with or trying to figure out so that us as a community we can uh, be here with you to solve that. My question. Okay, so um, Destiny Jones, you know, 
um, my master's thesis is going to be a museum outline, an exam, museum exhibit outline for Good Times TV show. And um, I think that JJ's character, because it's he's the most controversial, was what I was most interested in going through the show. But I think um, because there are this, this kind of bad look at his character, I wanted to see it as good. <laughs> and I think also with going through the show, I didn't really realize until I was watching season after season that he's truly the main character. It's hard to talk about the show and not talk about JJ. So even though I was most interested with his role in the beginning, now it's actually harder to talk about the other characters because I don't want JJ to overshadow them in the way that I kind of already knew beforehand. But now watching the show, it's like so in my face that I'm like, how can I do this? And using all of the things, and this is something that my amazing advisor helped me with, Kyle, is this idea that there are things that you see and things that you don't see. And using all of these roles, especially for the women in the show, the things that they do and the things we don't see them do that we see the male characters do is how I kind of built up this list of all these other things. So I think that it really was a struggle for me to, and as you go, especially with this type of research, it's like your whole thesis can change as you're going through. You don't really know what you're gonna find until you start combing through it. And when it came to me trying to figure out more of a gender roles approach of the show and how it showed 1970s black Chicago, that's where I was really struggling. And now, because of my amazing professor, um, now I can um, understand it more. I'll go. Um, this is really not within the, the purview of this panel, I guess, but because I work in digital humanities, I have encountered this, this um, the tendency to flatten and when you put people in boxes of an Excel spreadsheet or, or, or to tag their, their sexuality or their gender with, with uh, a single, single word when all of that isn't, doesn't fit into the binary boxes that we, we try. How to, to add nuance there, I'm really not sure I have an answer to the second part of the question. I'm kind of early in this, but to, I think that sometimes <laughs> we have to, uh, to, we have to be thoughtful throughout the process and then interrogate our, our own findings at, throughout this process. Um, we'll, we have peer, edit, peer review for, for some of that, but um, always uh, a practice has been taking notes as to, oh, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not sure I agree with this. I, I, maybe this categorization is incorrect. Maybe I need to clean this data in a different way. Uh, just being the solution has been a practice of, of mindfulness in that sense, but uh, I really don't have concrete answers, I'm afraid. Okay, uh, trying to remember all the parts of the question. The first part, uh, I'm, and you probably know this, I'm, I'm looking at the evolution of women in horror and science fiction media, film, TV, mostly film, uh, but I guess, um, the thing that I'm most excited about, I guess, are the time periods that I'm most into. So the 70s and the 80s, I find that I have to, to kind of dive into the 90s quite a bit for a lot of the scholarship that's going around um, to work with it. Um, finding out that I don't agree with a lot of the classic texts of it, you know, like um, finding problems with what's considered the kind of the seminal work of what I do, the thing that started it all and, and, and realizing do I want to shift my entire work to be me interrupting that and saying, I don't think you're right. I don't, I think you're talking about like being stuck in a binary. I, I feel like um, the whole conundrum of the final girl theory, I think I have hard times with a lot of it because it, it looks at it in a very uh, binary specific system that doesn't accept the possibilities of uh, gendering in any other way. It doesn't understand the possibilities of um, the possibility of gay characters. It doesn't have any place for that within in the way the final girl theory, theory was written. And that's kind of what everybody just takes as fact. And it's kind of, so it's like, do I want to switch what I'm doing and just do this analytical retelling of this concept that focuses on who, who the women were in these and who they really are. But I, I think for me, I, I, I had moments where I was like, hey, I don't think anybody's ever looked at this one little thing. 
And those moments have been really interesting, though, like the, the ability to say, all right, like, those, like the final girl, feel like all, the, all those kind of like cycle films of, of the 70s and 80s are very focused on girls in high school, you know, or, or girls in college. But hey, wait, but what about the films that are like girls who are in middle school? Like that, that happens quite a bit, you know, in the 80s. What about, uh, you know, a lot of it today for me has been this kind of multi-generational women stories. So like looking at things like the Halloween 2018, um, even uh, where the Terminator series goes, uh, there's a lot of this, the recent Texas Chainsaw, be it good or not, um, this whole idea of what happens to women 40 years after they survive and, and how does that not just change them, but it changes how they work with and live with the women in their lives and how it, that it affects them. I think that's kind of where to say that that like women in horror became a, a huge field to study, I think that's where it's going right now. And it's not just us theorizing it, but watching filmmakers theorize it as well as well and see how how do we feel about this and where it's going and the problems that we see and then the, the positives that we see. And so that's where I think I've been excited recently, what's going on in a film where I think horror waxes and wanes. It's one of those genres that gets uh, unpopular at times and it does never go away, but becomes unpopular and therefore there's less new to talk about. But um, yeah, I think seeing that we're in an uptick right now and that things are focused on women in their 50s and 60s. And that's a huge change that you would never, I mean, that's a huge faux pas to make stories where women in their 50s and 60s are the main characters anyway in Hollywood. They hate that, right? Women age out at 19 when they hit like 45. Yeah. So the fact that horror is kind of embracing this is like, no, let's see what happens to women after they've gone through traumatic experience and then they age. What happens next? So that's what's going on in the research now that's cool. Um, but yeah, I think that's all the things. All right. <laughs> Okay, I'll, I'll keep it quick. Um, my dissertation is based on a very, very kind of simple question, but it goes personally because uh, why did a certain novel group of sitcoms, which is fantasy sitcoms, suddenly emerge literally a very specific time, 1963, 1964, and why did they disappear almost as rapidly by 1967, 68? So a very specific question. Um, good thing that happened was you, know, you have your assumptions, your hypothesis, I've been warned not to have too much of a thesis going in because that kills. Um, and when I got some archival material that really confirmed what I was thinking, that was really, right? That was, but the danger I find is the more I watch the shows, the temptation to see them just so what's, you know, sort of as a self-fulfilling prophecy, you know, so that I, I read them as I want to read them because they agree with, what I've already written, that to me is maybe the hardest thing I'm going through, just from that watching standpoint, you know, to, to be honest, right? To, to let it go where it goes rather than where I want it to go. Sure, this could, oh, woo. <laughs> All right, you totally convinced me that culture is worth studying. I'm wondering what's revealed or obscured by this word popular. So how popular is popular and what about unpopular culture? Okay, I think unfortunately popular is by majority and that's not necessarily something we would have wanted, but I think that it's more like when you Google a genre, the first things that pop up. It's unfortunate, but that's just kind of how popularity works, I think in my sense. Um, when it comes to the unpopular question, I think that when you when people have the chance to find ratings for shows, or if you find like there's a app called TV Time, everyone should download it. It's amazing. Um, when you look at the shows, you can actually um, put your rating and see who liked what, and it's specific characters and specific episodes and everything. And being able to see how that change to me also shows how um, writers are changing it over time too. So throughout one season, you can have one parts of the show that's super unpopular, or a lot of shows, there's a huge chunk that's unpopular, and everybody actually hates it, and then magically something crazy happens, and everybody loves it again. So I think that when it comes to popular and unpopular, it's more about, when it comes to studying it, it's more about how it affects the show, and how it affects 
if people like it or not, rather than if it was popular to begin with. Um, each individual show has its own, I guess, popular and unpopular views. And I think studying that is what makes it more important. Okay, I'm gonna kind of fight back a little bit and say, unpopular culture is pop culture because we don't know the difference and it doesn't matter to the filmmaker or the creator. So just making something makes it pop culture because it's not, you didn't write like the next American novel. So therefore, if you wrote like a Stephen King style horror book instead, it's now pop culture, even if nobody buys it. So uh, I think the same is true across all formats. So pop music is pop music if it's danceable music that even if nobody's dancing to it because they don't own it. So I, I think in those realms of all of this is pop culture, regardless of people who like it or not. Um, and genre work is specific to the, it doesn't matter if people are into it right now, we're still making it. It's just, they'll find it later. So, and I think we're also in a time period where all of that is changing and it won't matter anymore anyway. Um, the Nielsen rating system is gotta find a whole new way, way to work because people have less and less cable boxes to hook them up to, you know what I mean? So we're in a, in a zone right now where more people are watching YouTube and Twitch than necessarily network television. So all of that's gonna change. And I think pop culture is as, as a generic enough term in these days that popular isn't even part of the world word anymore. It's just pop. I think, or just culture. I think it's almost redundant with the word culture because I think it's defined by what is part of our common vocabulary. What is part of our common consciousness? And there are things we might not see eye to eye on what they mean, but it's part of our vocabulary. So it's a part of the way we communicate is through our, our no common knowledge of certain things that are produced and we consume. So I, I, I don't know if that explains it, but. <laughs> okay. Y yeah, so uh, there's some, I guess I'd follow that just by saying, yeah, there's, <laughs> you might think of it as the the unpopular is sort of the other uh, what you what's the uncool whether that be the cult the cult that becomes a cult classic or trash cinema it's still um, it's still something worth studying. Uh. All right, guys, thank you so much. Let's have a round of applause. They keep clapping. So number one for our keynote speaker. Dr. Josiah Peterson. Sonia. Reggie, who ran our computer, and Isaac from SASN. I don't know where the other people went from Express Network, so. But thank you to them, and thank you to you guys. Um, just one other, two other quick things. One, clean, clean up your stuff when you leave. Uh, <laughs> two, we're gonna be doing our online panel next Friday for the students, talk about surviving the dissertation, lessons learned. Uh